Letter 44 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius and Nias Seneca, translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Philosophy and Pedigrees You are again insisting to me that you are a nobody, and saying that nature in the first place and fortune in the second have treated you too scurvily, and this in spite of the fact that you have it in your power to separate yourself from the crowd and rise to the highest human happiness. If there is any good in philosophy, it is this, that it never looks into pedigrees. All men, if traced back to their original source, spring from the gods. You are a Roman knight, and your persistent work promoted you to this class. Yet surely there are many to whom the fourteen rows are barred. The Senate chamber is not open to all. The army, too, is scrupulous in choosing those whom it admits to toil and danger. But a noble mind is free to all men. According to this test, we may all gain distinction. Philosophy neither rejects nor selects any one. Its light shines for all. Socrates was no aristocrat. Cleanthes worked at a well and served as a hired man watering a garden. Philosophy did not find Plato already a nobleman. It made him one. Why then should you despair of becoming able to rank with men like these? They are all your ancestors, if you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of them. And you will do so if you convince yourself at the outset that no man outdoes you in real nobility. We have all had the same number of forefathers. There is no man whose first beginning does not transcend memory. Plato says, Every king springs from a race of slaves, and every slave has had kings among his ancestors. The flight of time, with its vicissitudes, has jumbled all such things together, and fortune has turned them upside down then who is well born he who is by nature well fitted for virtue that is the one point to be considered otherwise if you hark back to antiquity every one traces back to a date before which there is nothing from the earliest beginnings of the universe to the present time we have been led forward out of origins that were alternately illustrious and ignoble a hawful of smoke begrimed bus does not make the nobleman. No past life has been lived to lend us glory, and that which has existed before us is not ours. The soul alone renders us noble, and it may rise superior to fortune out of any earlier condition, no matter what that condition has been. Suppose, then, that you were not a Roman knight but a freedman, you might nevertheless by your own efforts come to be the only freeman amid a throng of gentlemen. How, you ask? Simply by distinguishing between good and bad things, without patterning your opinion from the populace. You should look not to the source from which these things come, but to the goal toward which they tend. If there is anything that can make life happy, it is good on its own merits, for it cannot degenerate into evil. Where, then, lies the mistake, since all men crave the happy life? It is that they regard the means for producing happiness as happiness itself. And, while seeking happiness, they are really fleeing from it. For although the sum and substance of the happy life is unalloyed freedom from care, and though the secret of such freedom is unshaken confidence. Yet men gather together that which causes worry, and while traveling life's treacherous road, not only have burdens to bear, but even draw burdens to themselves. Hence they recede farther and farther from the achievement of that which they seek. And the more effort they expend, the more they hinder themselves and are set back. This is what happens when you hurry through a maze. The faster you go, the worse you are entangled. Farewell. 
End of letter 44. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 45 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Sophistical Argumentation You complain that in your part of the world there is a scant supply of books. But it is quality rather than quantity that matters. A limited list of reading benefits. A varied assortment serves only for delight. He who would arrive at the appointed end must follow a single road and not wander through many ways. What you suggest is not traveling, it is mere tramping. But, you say, I should rather have you give me advice than books. Still, I am ready to send you all the books I have, to ransack the whole storehouse. If it were possible, I should join you there myself, and were it not for the hope that you will soon complete your term of office, I should have imposed upon myself this old man's journey. No Scylla or Charybdis or their storied straits could have frightened me away. I should not only have crossed over, but should have been willing to swim over those waters, provided that I could greet you and judge in your presence how much you had grown in spirit. Your desire, however, that I should dispatch to you my own writings does not make me think myself learned, any more than a request for my picture would flatter my beauty. I know that it is due to your charity rather than to your judgment, and even if it is the result of judgment, it was charity that forced the judgment upon you. But whatever the quality of my works may be, read them as if I were still seeking and were not aware of the truth and were seeking it obstinately, too. For I have sold myself to no man. I bear the name of no master. I give much credit to the judgment of great men, but I claim something also for my own. For these men, too, have left us, not positive discoveries, but problems whose solution is still to be sought. They might perhaps have discovered the essentials, had they not sought the superfluous also. They lost much time in quibbling about words and in sophistical argumentation. All that sort of thing exercises the wit to no purpose. We tie knots and bind up words in double meanings, and then try to untie them. Have we leisure enough for this? Do we already know how to live or die? We should rather proceed with our whole souls toward the point where it is our duty to take heed, lest things, as well as words, deceive us. Why, pray, do you discriminate between similar words, when nobody is ever deceived by them except during the discussion? It is things that lead us astray. It is between things that you must discriminate. We embrace evil instead of good. We pray for something opposite to that which we have prayed for in the past. Our prayers clash with our prayers, our plans with our plans. How closely flattery resembles friendship. It not only apes friendship, but outdoes it, passing it in the race. With wide open and indulgent ears it is welcomed and sinks to the depths of the heart and it is pleasing precisely wherein it does harm. Show me how I may be able to see through this resemblance. An enemy comes to me full of compliments, in the guise of a friend. Vices creep into our hearts under the name of virtues. Rashness lurks beneath the appellation of bravery. Moderation is called sluggishness, and the coward is regarded as prudent, there is great danger if we go astray in these matters. So stamp them with special labels. Then, too, the man who is asked whether he has horns on his head is not such a fool as to feel for them on his forehead, nor again so silly or dense that you can persuade him by means of argumentation, no matter how subtle, that he does not know the facts. Such quibbles are just as harmlessly deceptive as the juggler's cup and dice. 
in which it is the very trickery that pleases me. But show me how the trick is done, and I have lost my interest therein. And I hold the same opinion about these tricky word-plays. For by what other name can one call such sophistries? Not to know them does no harm, and mastering them does no good. At any rate, if you wish to sift doubtful meanings of this kind, teach us that the happy man is not he whom the crowd deems happy, namely, he into whose coffers mighty sums have flowed, but he whose possessions are all in his soul, who is upright and exalted, who spurns inconstancy, who sees no man with whom he wishes to change places, who rates men only at their value as men, who takes nature for his teacher, conforming to her laws and living as she commands, whom no violence can deprive of his possessions, who turns evil into good, is unerring in judgment, unshaken, unafraid, who may be moved by force but never moved to distraction, whom fortune, when she hurls at him with all her might the deadliest missile in her armory, may graze though rarely, but never wound. For fortune's other missiles, with which she vanquishes mankind in general, rebound from such a one, like hail which rattles on the roof with no harm to the dweller therein, and then melts away. Why do you bore me with that which you yourself call the liar fallacy, about which so many books have been written? Come now, Suppose that my whole life is a lie. Prove that to be wrong, and, if you are sharp enough, bring that back to the truth. At present, it holds things to be essential of which the greater part is superfluous. And even that which is not superfluous is of no significance, in respect to its power of making one fortunate and blessed. For, if a thing be necessary, it does not follow that it is a good. Else we degrade the meaning of good if we apply that name to bread and barley porridge and other commodities without which we cannot live. The good must in every case be necessary, but that which is necessary is not in every case a good, since certain very paltry things are indeed necessary. No one is to such an extent ignorant of the noble meaning of the word good, as to debase it to the level of these humdrum utilities. What, then? Shall you not rather transfer your efforts to making it clear to all men that the search for the superfluous means a great outlay of time, and that many have gone through life merely accumulating the instruments of life? Consider individuals. Survey men in general. There is none whose life does not look forward to the morrow. What harm is there in this, you ask? Infinite harm. For such persons do not live, but are preparing to live. They postpone everything. Even if we paid strict attention, life would soon get ahead of us. But as we are now, Life finds us lingering and passes us by, as if it belonged to another, and though it ends on the final day, it perishes every day. But I must not exceed the bounds of a letter, which ought not to fill the reader's left hand, so I shall postpone to another day our case against the hair-splitters, those over-subtle fellows who make argumentation supreme instead of subordinate. Farewell. End of letter forty five. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter forty six of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On a new book by Lucilius. I received the book of yours which you promised me. I opened it hastily with the idea of glancing over it at leisure, for I meant only to taste the volume. But by its own charm, 
the book coaxed me into traversing it more at length. You may understand from this fact how eloquent it was, for it seemed to be written in the smooth style, and yet did not resemble your handiwork or mine, but at first sight might have been ascribed to Titus, Livius, or to Epicurus. Moreover, I was so impressed and carried along by its charm that I finished it without any postponement. The sunlight called to me, hunger warned, and clouds were lowering, but I absorbed the book from beginning to end. I was not merely pleased. I rejoiced. So full of wit and spirit it was. I should have added force, had the book contained moments of repose, or had it risen to energy only at intervals. But I found that there was no burst of force, but an even flow, a style that was vigorous and chaste. Nevertheless, I notice from time to time your sweetness, and here and there that mildness of yours. Your style is lofty and noble. I want you to keep to this manner and this direction. Your subject also contributed something. For this reason you should choose productive topics, which will lay hold of the mind and arouse it. I shall discuss the book more fully after a second perusal. Meantime, my judgment is somewhat unsettled, just as if I had heard it read aloud and had not read it myself. You must allow me to examine it also. You need not be afraid. You shall hear the truth. Lucky fellow, to offer a man no opportunity to tell you lies at such long range. Unless, perhaps, even now, when excuses for lying are taken away, Custom serves as an excuse for our telling each other lies. Farewell. End of letter 46. Recording by John Van Stan. Savannah, Georgia. Letter 47 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Anias Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Master and Slave I am glad to learn, through those who come from you, that you live on friendly terms with your slaves. This befits a sensible and well-educated man like yourself. They are slaves, people declare. Nay, rather they are men. Slaves! No, comrades! Slaves! No, they are unpretentious friends. Slaves! No, they are our fellow-slaves. If one reflects that fortune has equal rights over slaves and free men alike. That is why I smile at those who think it degrading for a man to dine with his slave. But why should they think it degrading? It is only because purse-proud etiquette surrounds a householder at his dinner with a mob of standing slaves. The master eats more than he can hold, and with monstrous greed loads his belly until it is stretched, and at length ceases to do the work of a belly, so that he is at greater pains to discharge all the food than he was to stuff it down. All this time the poor slaves may not move their lips even to speak. The slightest murmur is repressed by the rod. Even a chance sound a cough, a sneeze, or a hiccup, is visited with the lash. There is a grievous penalty for the slightest breach of silence. All night long they must stand about hungry and dumb. The result of it all is that these slaves, who may not talk in their master's presence, talk about their master. But the slaves of former days, who were permitted to converse not only in their master's presence, but actually with him, whose mouths were not stitched up tight, were ready to bear their necks for their master, to bring upon their own heads any danger that threatened them. They spoke at the feast, but kept silence during torture. Finally, the saying in allusion to this same high-handed treatment becomes current. As many enemies as you have slaves. They are not enemies when we acquire them, we make them enemies. 
I shall pass over other cruel and inhuman conduct towards them, for we maltreat them, not as if they were men, but as if they were beasts of burden. When we recline at a banquet, one slave mops up the disgorged food, another crouches beneath the table and gathers up the leftovers of the tipsy guests, another carves the priceless game birds, with unerring strokes and skilled hand, he cuts choice morsels along the breast or the rump. Hapless fellow, to live only for the purpose of cutting fat capons correctly. Unless, indeed, the other man is still more unhappy than he, who teaches this art for pleasure's sake, rather than he who learns it because he must. Another, who serves the wine, must dress like a woman and wrestle with his advancing years. He cannot get away from his boyhood. He is dragged back to it, and though he has already acquired a soldier's figure, he is kept beardless by having his hair smoothed away or plucked out by the roots, and he must remain awake throughout the night, dividing his time between his master's drunkenness and his lust. In the chamber he must be a man at the feast of boy. Another whose duty it is to put a valuation on the guests, must stick to his task, poor fellow, and watch to see whose flattery and whose immodesty, whether of appetite or of language, is to get them an invitation for tomorrow. Think also of the poor purveyors of food, who note their master's tastes with delicate skill, who know what special flavors will sharpen their appetite, what will please their eyes, and what new combinations will rouse their cloyed stomachs, what food will excite their loathing through sheer satiety, and what will stir them to hunger on that particular day. With slaves like these, the master cannot bear to dine. He would think it beneath his dignity to associate with his slave at the same table, heaven forfend. But how many masters is he creating in these very men? I have seen standing in the line before the door of Callistus, the former master of Callistus. I have seen the master himself shut out while others were welcomed. The master who once fastened the for sale ticket on Callistus and put him in the market along with the good for nothing slaves. But he has been paid off by that slave who was shuffled into the first lot of those on whom the crier practices his lungs. The slave, too, in his turn, has cut his name from the list, and in his turn has adjudged him unfit to enter his house. The master sold Callistus, but how much has Callistus made his master pay for? Kindly remember that he whom you call your slave sprang from the same stock, is smiled upon by the same skies, and on equal terms with yourself breathes, lives and dies. It is just as possible for you to see in him a freeborn man, as for him to see in you a slave. As a result of the massacres in Marius's day, many a man of distinguished birth, who was taking the first steps toward senatorial rank by service in the army, was humbled by fortune, one becoming a shepherd, another a caretaker of a country cottage. Despise, then, if you dare, those to whose estate you may at any time descend, even when you are despising them. I do not wish to involve myself in too large a question and to discuss the treatment of slaves, towards whom we Romans are excessively haughty, cruel, and insulting. But this is the kernel of my advice. Treat your inferiors as you would be treated by your betters and as often as you reflect how much power you have over a slave, remember that your master has just as much power over you. But I have no master, you say. You are still young. Perhaps you will have one. Do you not know at what age Hecuba entered captivity, or Cressus, or the mother of Darius, or Plato, or Diogenes? associate with your slave on kindly even on affable terms let him talk with you plan with you live with you 
I know that at this point all the exquisites will cry out against me in a body. They will say, There is nothing more debasing, more disgraceful than this. But these are the very persons whom I sometimes surprise kissing the hands of other men's slaves. Do you not see even this? How our ancestors removed from masters everything invidious, and from slaves everything insulting? They called the master father of the household, and the slaves members of the household, a custom which still holds in the mime. They establish a holiday on which masters and slaves should eat together, not as the only day for this custom, but as obligatory on that day in any case. They allowed the slaves to attain honors in the household and to pronounce judgment. They held that a household was a miniature commonwealth. Do you mean to say, comes the retort, that I must seat all my slaves at my own table? No, not any more than that you should invite all free men to it. You are mistaken if you think that I would bar from my table certain slaves whose duties are more humble, as, for example, yonder muleteer or yonder herdsman. I propose to value them according to their character and not according to their duties. Each man acquires his character for himself, but accident assigns his duties. Invite some to your table because they deserve the honor, and others that they may come to deserve it. For, if there is any slavish quality in them as the result of their low associations, it will be shaken off by intercourse with men of gentler breeding. You need not, my dear Lucilius, hunt for friends only in the Forum or in the Senate House. If you are careful and attentive, you will find them at home also. Good material often stands idle for want of an artist. Make the experiment, and you will find it so. As he is a fool who, when purchasing a horse, does not consider the animal's points, but merely his saddle and bridle, so he is doubly a fool who values a man from his clothes or from his rank, which indeed is only a robe that clothes us. He is a slave. His soul, however, may be that of a free man. He is a slave. But shall that stand in his way? Show me a man who is not a slave. One is a slave to lust, another to greed, another to ambition, and all men are slaves to fear. I will name you an ex-consul who is a slave to an old hag, a millionaire who is a slave to a serving-maid. I will show you youths of the noblest birth and serfdom to pantomime players. No servitude is more disgraceful than that which is self-imposed. You should therefore not be deterred by these finicky persons from showing yourself to your slaves as an affable person, and not proudly superior to them. They ought to respect you rather than fear you. Some may maintain that I am now offering the liberty cap to slaves in general, and toppling down lords from their high estate, because I bid slaves respect their masters instead of fearing them. They say, This is what he plainly means. Slaves are to pay respect as if they were clients or early morning callers. Anyone who holds this opinion forgets that what is enough for a god cannot be too little for a master. Respect means love, and love and fear cannot be mingled. So I hold that you are entirely right in not wishing to be feared by your slaves, and in lashing them merely with the tongue. Only dumb animals need the thong. That which annoys us does not necessarily injure us, but we are driven into wild rage by our luxurious lives, so that whatever does not answer our whims arouses our anger. We don the temper of kings, for they too, forgetful alike of their own strength and of other men's weakness, grow white-hot with rage, as if they had received an injury, 
when they are entirely protected from danger of such injury by their exalted station. They are not unaware that this is true, but by finding fault they seize upon opportunities to do harm. They insist that they have received injuries in order that they may inflict them. I do not wish to delay you longer, for you need no exhortation. This, among other things, is a mark of good character. It forms its own judgments and abides by them. But badness is fickle and frequently changing, not for the better, but for something different. Farewell. End of letter 47. Recording by John Van Stan. Savannah, Georgia. Letter 48 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annaeus Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On quibbling as unworthy of the philosopher. In answering to the letter which you wrote me while traveling, a letter as long as the journey itself, I shall reply later. I ought to go into retirement and consider what sort of advice I should give you. For you yourself, who consult me, also reflected for a long time whether to do so. How much more, then, should I myself reflect, since more deliberation is necessary in settling than in propounding a problem? And this is particularly true when one thing is advantageous to you and another to me. Am I speaking again in the guise of an Epicurean? But the fact is, the same thing is advantageous to me which is advantageous to you. For I am not your friend, unless whatever is at issue concerning you is my concern also. Friendship produces between us a partnership in all our interests. There is no such thing as good or bad fortune for the individual. We live in common. And no one can live happily who has regard to himself alone and transforms everything into a question of his own utility. You must live for your neighbor if you would live for yourself. This fellowship maintained with scrupulous care, which makes us mingle as men with our fellow men, and holds that the human race have certain rights in common, is also of great help in cherishing the more intimate fellowship which is based on friendship, concerning which I began to speak above. For he that has much in common with a fellow man will have all things in common with a friend. And on this point, my excellent Lucilius, I should like to have those subtle dialecticians of yours advise me how I ought to help a friend, or how a fellow man, rather, than tell me in how many ways the word friend is used, and how many meanings the word man possesses. Lo, wisdom and folly are taking opposite sides. Which shall I join? Which party would you have me follow? On that side, man is the equivalent of friend. On the other side, friend is not the equivalent of man. The one wants a friend for his own advantage. The other wants to make himself an advantage to his friend. What you have to offer me is nothing but distortion of words and splitting of syllables. It is clear that unless I can devise some very tricky premises and, by false deductions, tack on to them a fallacy which springs from the truth, I shall not be able to distinguish between what is desirable and what is to be avoided. I am ashamed. Old men as we are, dealing with a problem so serious, we make play of it. Mouse is a syllable. Now a mouse eats cheese, therefore a syllable eats cheese. Suppose now that I cannot solve this problem. See what peril hangs over my head as a result of such ignorance. What a scrape I shall be in. Without doubt I must beware, or some day I shall be catching syllables in a mouse trap. Or if I grow careless, a book may devour my cheese unless perhaps the following syllogism is shrewder still. Mouse is a syllable. Now a syllable does not eat cheese. Therefore a mouse does not eat cheese. What childish nonsense! Do we knit our brows over this sort of problem? 
Do we let our beards grow long for this reason? Is this the matter which we teach with sour and pale faces? Would you really know what philosophy offers to humanity? Philosophy offers counsel. Death calls away one man, and poverty chafes another. A third is worried either by his neighbor's wealth or by his own. So-and-so is afraid of bad luck. Another desires to get away from his own good fortune. Some are ill-treated by men, others by the gods. Why, then, do you frame for me such games as these? It is no occasion for jest. You are retained as counsel for unhappy mankind. You have promised to help those in peril by sea, those in captivity, the sick and the needy, and those whose heads are under the poised axe. Whither are you straying? What are you doing? This friend in whose company you are jesting is in fear. Help him, and take the noose from about his neck. Men are stretching out, imploring hands to you on all sides. Lives ruined and in danger of ruin are begging for some assistance. Men's hopes, men's resources depend upon you. They ask that you deliver them from all their restlessness, that you reveal to them, scattered and wandering as they are, the clear light of truth. Tell them what nature has made necessary, and what superfluous. Tell them how simple are the laws that she has laid down, how pleasant and unimpeded life is for those who follow these laws, but how bitter and perplexed it is for those who have put their trust in opinion rather than in nature. I should deem your games of logic to be of some avail in relieving men's burdens, if you could first show me what part of these burdens they will relieve. What among these games of yours banishes lust, or controls it? Would that I could say that they were merely of no profit. They are positively harmful. I can make it perfectly clear to you whenever you wish that a noble spirit, when involved in such subtleties, is impaired and weakened. I am ashamed to say what weapons they supply to men who are destined to go to war with fortune, and how poorly they equip them. Is this the path to the greatest good? Is philosophy to proceed by such claptrap and by quibbles which would be a disgrace and even a reproach for expounders of the law? For what else is it that you men are doing, when you deliberately ensnare the person to whom you are putting questions, than making it appear that the man has lost his case on a technical error? But just as the judge can reinstate those who have lost a suit in this way, so philosophy has reinstated these victims of quibbling to their former condition. Why do you men abandon your mighty promises, and after having assured me in high-sounding language that you will permit the glitter of gold to dazzle my eyesight no more than the gleam of the sword, and that I shall with mighty steadfastness spurn both that which all men crave and that which all men fear, why do you descend to the A, B, C's of scholastic pedance? What is your answer? Is this the path to heaven? For that is exactly what philosophy promises me, that I shall be made equal to God. For this I have been summoned. For this purpose I have come. Philosophy, keep your promise. Therefore, my dear Lucilius, withdraw yourself as far as possible from these exceptions and objections of so-called philosophers. Frankness and simplicity beseem true goodness. Even if there were many years left to you, you would have had to spend them frugally in order to have enough for the necessary things. But as it is, when your time is so scant... What madness it is to learn superfluous things. Farewell. End of letter 48. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.
Letter 49 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Shortness of Life A man is indeed lazy and careless, my dear Lucilius, if he is reminded of a friend only by seeing some landscape which stirs the memory. And yet there are times when the old familiar haunts stir up a sense of loss that has been stored away in the soul not bringing back dead memories but rousing them from their dormant state just as the sight of a lost friend's favorite slave or his cloak or his house renews the mourner's grief even though it has been softened by time now lo and behold campania and especially naples and your beloved pompeii struck me when i viewed them with a wonderfully fresh sense of longing for you you stand in full view before my eyes. I am on the point of parting from you. I see you choking down your tears and resisting without success the emotions that well up at the very moment when you try to check them. I seem to have lost you but a moment ago. For what is not but a moment ago, when one begins to use the memory? It was but a moment ago that I sat, as a lad, in the school of the philosopher Sodian, but a moment ago that I began to plead in the courts, but a moment ago that I lost the desire to plead, but a moment ago that I lost the ability. Infinitely swift is the flight of time, as those see more clearly who are looking backwards. For when we are intent on the present, we do not notice it, so gentle is the passage of time's headlong flight. Do you ask the reason for this? All past time is in the same place. It all presents the same aspect to us. It lies together. Everything slips into the same abyss. Besides, an event which in its entirety is of brief compass cannot contain long intervals. The time which we spend in living is but a point, nay, even less than a point. But this point of time, infinitesimal as it is, nature has mocked by making it seem outwardly of longer duration. She has taken one portion thereof and made it infancy, another childhood, another youth, another the gradual slope, so to speak, from youth to old age, and old age itself is still another. How many steps for how short a climb! It was but a moment ago that I saw you off on your journey. And yet this moment ago makes up a goodly share of our existence, which is so brief. We should reflect that it will soon come to an end altogether. In other years, time did not seem to me to go so swiftly. Now it seems fast beyond belief, perhaps because I feel that the finish line is moving closer to me or it may be that I have begun to take heed and reckon up my losses. For this reason, I am all the more angry that some men claim the major portion of this time for superfluous things. Time which, no matter how carefully it is guarded, cannot suffice even for necessary things. Cicero declared that if the number of his days were doubled, he should not have time to read the lyric poets and you may rate the dialecticians in the same class, but they are foolish in a more melancholy way. The lyric poets are avowedly frivolous, but the dialecticians believe that they are themselves engaged upon serious business. I do not deny that one must cast a glance at dialectic, but it ought to be a mere glance, a sort of greeting from the threshold, merely that one may not be deceived, or judge these pursuits to contain any hidden matters of great worth. Why do you torment yourself, and lose weight over some problem which it is more clever to have scorned than to solve? When a soldier is undisturbed and travelling at his ease, he can hunt for trifles along his way. But when the enemy is closing in on the rear, and a command is given to quicken the pace, Necessity makes him throw away everything which he picked up in moments of peace and leisure. 
I have no time to investigate disputed inflections of words, or to try my cunning upon them. Behold the gathering clans, the fast-shut gates, and weapons wetted ready for the war. I need a stout heart to hear without flinching this din of battle which sounds round about. And all would rightly think me mad if, when grey beards and women were heaping up rocks for the fortifications, when the armor-clad youths inside the gate were awaiting, or even demanding, the order for a sally, when the spears of the foemen were quivering in our gates and the very ground was rocking with mines and subterranean passages, I say, they would rightly think me mad if I were to sit idle, putting such petty posers as this. What you have not lost you have, but you have not lost any horns, therefore you have horns. Or other tricks constructed after the model of this piece of sheer silliness. And yet I may well seem in your eyes no less mad if I spend my energies on that sort of thing. For even now I am in a state of siege. And yet in the former case it would be merely a peril from the outside that threatened me, and a wall that sundered me from the foe. As it is now, death-dealing perils are in my very presence. I have no time for such nonsense. A mighty undertaking is on my hands. What am I to do? Death is on my trail, and life is fleeting away. Teach me something with which to face these troubles. Bring it to pass that I shall cease trying to escape from death, and that life may cease to escape from me. Give me courage to meet hardships. Make me calm in the face of the unavoidable. Relax the straitened limits of the time which is allotted me. Show me that the good in life does not depend upon life's length, but upon the use we make of it. Also, that it is possible, or rather usual, for a man who has lived long to have lived too little. Say to me when I lay down to sleep, You may not wake again. And when I have waked, You may not go to sleep again. Say to me when I go forth from my house, You may not return. And when I return, You may never go forth again. You are mistaken if you think that only on an ocean voyage there is a very slight space between life and death. No, the distance between is just as narrow everywhere. It is not everywhere that death shows himself so near at hand, yet everywhere he is as near at hand. Rid me of these shadowy terrors. Then you will more easily deliver to me the instruction for which I have prepared myself. At our birth, nature made us teachable, and gave us reason, not perfect, but capable of being perfected. Discuss for me justice, duty, thrift, and that twofold purity, both the purity which abstains from another's person, and that which takes care of one's own self. If you will only refuse to lead me along bypaths, I shall more easily reach the goal at which I am aiming. For, as the tragic poet says, the language of truth is simple. We should not, therefore, make that language intricate, since there is nothing less fitting for a soul of great endeavor than such crafty cleverness. Farewell. End of Letter 49 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Letter 50 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Anias Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Our Blindness and Its Cure I received your letter many months after you had posted it. Accordingly, I thought it useless to ask the carrier what you were busied with. He must have a particularly good memory if he can remember that. But I hope by this time... You are living in such a way that I can be sure what it is you are busied with, no matter where you may be. For what else are you busied with except improving yourself every day? 
laying aside some error and coming to understand that the faults which you attribute to circumstances are in yourself we are indeed apt to ascribe certain faults to the place or to the time but those faults will follow us no matter how we change our place you know harpaste my wife's female clown she has remained in my house a burden incurred from a legacy i particularly disprove of these freaks whenever i wish to enjoy the quips of a clown i am not compelled to hunt far i can laugh at myself now this clown suddenly became blind the story sounds incredible but i assure you that it is true she does not know that she is blind she keeps asking her attendant to change her quarters she says that her apartments are too dark you can see clearly that that which makes us smile in the case of harpaste happens to all the rest of us nobody understands that he is himself greedy or that he is covetous yet the blind ask for a guide while we wander without one saying i am not self-seeking but one cannot live at rome in any other way i am not extravagant but mere living in this city demands a great outlay it is not my fault that i have a choleric disposition or that i have not settled down to any definite scheme of life it is due to my youth why do we deceive ourselves the evil that afflicts us is not external it is within us situated in our very vitals for that reason we attain soundness with all the more difficulty because we do not know that we are diseased suppose that we have begun the cure when shall we throw off all these diseases with all their virulence at present we do not even consult the physician whose work would be easier if he were called in when the complaint was in its early stages the tender and the inexperienced minds would follow his advice if he pointed out the right way no man finds it difficult to return to nature except the man who has deserted nature we blush to receive instruction in sound sense but by heaven if we think it base to seek a teacher of this art we should also abandon any hope that so great a good could be instilled into us by mere chance no we must work to tell the truth even the work is not great if only as i said we begin to mould and reconstruct our souls before they are hardened by sin but i do not despair even of a hardened sinner there is nothing that will not surrender to persistent treatment to concentrated and careful attention however much the timber may be bent you can make it straight again heat unbends curved beams and wood that grew naturally in another shape is fashioned artificially according to our needs how much more easily does the soul permit itself to be shaped pliable as it is and more yielding than any liquid for what else is the soul than air in a certain state and you see that air is more adaptable than any other matter in proportion as it is rarer than any other there is nothing lucilius to hinder you from entertaining good hopes about us just because we are even now in the grip of evil or because we have long been possessed thereby there is no man to whom a good mind comes before an evil one it is the evil mind that gets first hold on all of us learning virtue means unlearning vice we should therefore proceed to the task of freeing ourselves from faults with all the more courage because when once committed to us the good is an everlasting possession virtue is not unlearned for opposites find difficulty in clinging where they do not belong therefore they can be driven out and hustled away but qualities that come to a place which is rightfully theirs abide faithfully virtue is according to nature vice is opposed to it and hostile but although virtues when admitted cannot depart and are easy to guard yet the first steps in the approach to them are toilsome because it is characteristic of a weak and diseased mind to fear that which is unfamiliar the mind must therefore be forced to make a beginning from then on the medicine is not bitter 
for just as soon as it is curing us it begins to give pleasure. One enjoys other cures only after health is restored, but a draught of philosophy is at the same moment wholesome and pleasant. Farewell. End of letter 50. Recording by John Van Stan. Savannah, Georgia. Letter 51 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Anias Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Baia and Morals. Every man does the best he can, my dear Lucilius. You over there have Etna, that lofty and most celebrated mountain of Sicily, although I cannot make out why Messala, or was it Valgius, for I have been reading in both, has called it unique. Inasmuch as many regions belch forth fire, not merely the lofty ones where the phenomenon is more frequent, presumably because fire rises to the greatest possible height, but low-lying places also. As for myself, I do the best I can. I have had to be satisfied with Baia, and I left it the day after I reached it, for Baia is a place to be avoided, because, though it has certain natural advantages, luxury has claimed it for her own exclusive resort. What then, you say, should any place be singled out as an object of aversion? Not at all. But just as, to the wise and upright man, one style of clothing is more suitable than another, without his having an aversion for any particular color, but because he thinks that some colors do not befit one who has adopted the simple life, so there are places also, which the wise man, or he who is on the way toward wisdom, will avoid as foreign to good morals. Therefore, if he is contemplating withdrawal from the world, he will not select Canopus, although Canopus does not keep any man from living simply, nor Baia either, for both places have begun to be resorts of vice. At Canopus luxury pampers itself to the utmost degree. At Baia it is even more lax, as if the place itself demanded a certain amount of license." We ought to select abodes which are wholesome not only for the body, but also for the character. Just as I do not care to live in a place of torture, neither do I care to live in a café. To witness persons wandering drunk along the beach, the riotous reveling of sailing parties, the lakes a din with choral song, and all the other ways in which luxury, when it is, so to speak, released from the restraints of law, not merely sins, but blazons its sins abroad. Why must I witness all this? We ought to see to it that we flee to the greatest possible distance from provocations to vice. We should toughen our minds, and remove them far from the allurements of pleasure. A single winter relaxed Hannibal's fiber. His pampering in Campania took the vigor out of that hero, who had triumphed over alpine snows. He conquered with his weapons, but was conquered by his vices. We, too, have a war to wage, a type of warfare in which there is allowed no rest or furlough. To be conquered, in the first place, are pleasures, which, as you see, have carried off even the sternest characters. If a man has once understood how great is the task which he has entered upon, he will see that there must be no dainty or effeminate conduct. What have I to do with those hot baths, or with the sweating room where they shut in the dry steam which is to drain your strength? Perspiration should flow only after toil. Suppose we do what Hannibal did. Check the course of events. Give up the war and give over our bodies to be coddled. Every one would rightly blame us for our untimely sloth, a thing fraught with peril even for the victor, to say nothing of one who is only on the way to victory. And we have even less right to do this than those followers of the Carthaginian flag, for our danger is greater than theirs if we slacken, and our toil is greater than theirs even if we press ahead. Fortune is fighting against me and I shall not carry out her commands. 
I refuse to submit to the yoke. Nay, rather, I shake off the yoke that is upon me, an act which demands even greater courage. The soul is not to be pampered. Surrendering to pleasure means also surrendering to pain, surrendering to toil, surrendering to poverty. Both ambition and anger will wish to have the same rights over me as pleasure, and I shall be torn asunder, or, rather, pulled to pieces amid all these conflicting passions. I have set freedom before my eyes, and I am striving for that reward. And what is freedom, you ask? It means not being a slave to any circumstance, to any constraint, to any chance. It means compelling fortune to enter the lists on equal terms, and on the day when I know that I have the upper hand, her power will be naught. When I have death in my control, shall I take orders from her? Therefore, a man occupied with such reflections should choose an austere and pure dwelling place. The spirit is weakened by surroundings that are too pleasant, and without a doubt one's place of residence can contribute towards impairing its vigor. Animals whose hooves are hardened on rough ground can travel any road, but when they are fattened on soft, marshy meadows, their hooves are soon worn out. The bravest soldier comes from rock-ribbed regions, but the town-bred and the home-bred are sluggish in action. The hand which turns from the plough to the sword never objects to toil, but your sleek and well-dressed dandy quails at the first cloud of dust. Being trained in a rugged country strengthens the character and fits it for great undertakings. It was more honorable in Scipio to spend his exile at Laternum than at Baia. His downfall did not need a setting so effeminate. Those also into whose hands the rising fortunes of Rome first transferred the wealth of the state, Gaius Marius, Gnaeus Pompey, and Caesar, did indeed build villas near Baia, but they set them on the very tops of the mountains. This seemed more soldier-like, to look down from a lofty height upon lands spread far and wide below. Note the situation, position, and type of building which they chose. You will see that they were not country places. They were camps. Do you suppose that Cato would ever have dwelt in a pleasure palace? That he might count the lewd women as they sailed past? The many kinds of barges painted in all sorts of colors? The roses which were wafted about the lake? or that he might listen to the nocturnal brawls of serenaders. Would he not have preferred to remain in the shelter of a trench, thrown up by his own hands to serve for a single night? Would not any one who is a man have his slumbers broken by a war trumpet rather than by a chorus of serenaders? But I have been haranguing against Baia long enough, although I never could harangue often enough against vice. Vice, Lucilius, is what I wish you to proceed against without limit and without end, for it has neither limit nor end. If any vice rend your heart, cast it away from you, and if you cannot be rid of it in any other way, pluck out your heart also. Above all, drive pleasures from your sight. Hate them beyond all other things, for they are like the bandits whom the Egyptians call lovers, who embrace us only to garret us. Farewell. End of letter 51. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 52 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius and Nias Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On choosing our teachers. What is this force, Lucilius, that drags us in one direction when we are aiming at another, urging us on to the exact place from which we long to withdraw? What is it that wrestles with our spirit and does not allow us to desire anything once for all? We veer from plan to plan. None of our wishes is free, none is unqualified. None is lasting. 
but it is the fool you say who is inconsistent nothing suits him for long but how or when can we tear ourselves away from this folly no man by himself has sufficient strength to rise above it he needs a helping hand and some one to extricate him epicurus remarks that certain men have worked their way to the truth without any one's assistance carving out their own passage and he gives special praise to these for their impulse has come from within and they have forged to the front by themselves again he says there are others who need outside help who will not proceed unless someone leads the way but who will follow faithfully of these he says metrodorus was one this type of man is also excellent but belongs to the second grade we ourselves are not of that first class either we shall be well treated if we are admitted into the second nor need you despise a man who can gain salvation only with the assistance of another the will to be saved means a great deal too you will find still another class of man and a class not to be despised who can be forced and driven into righteousness who do not need a guide as much as they require some one to encourage and as it were to force them along this is the third variety if you ask me for a man of this pattern also epicurus tells us that hermarchus was such and of the two last named classes he is more ready to congratulate the one but he feels more respect for the other for although both reach the same goal it is a greater credit to have brought about the same result with the more difficult material upon which to work suppose that two buildings have been erected unlike as to their foundations but equal in height and in grandeur one is built on faultless ground and the process of erection goes right ahead in the other case the foundations have exhausted the building materials for they have been sunk into soft and shifting ground and much labor has been wasted in reaching the solid rock as one looks at both of them one sees clearly what progress the former has made but the larger and more difficult part of the latter is hidden so with men's dispositions some are pliable and easy to manage but others have to be laboriously wrought out by hand so to speak and are wholly employed in the making of their own foundations i should accordingly deem more fortunate the man who has never had any trouble with himself but the other i feel has deserved better of himself who has won a victory over the meanness of his own nature and has not gently led himself but has wrestled his way to wisdom you may be sure that this refractory nature which demands much toil has been implanted in us there are obstacles in our path so let us fight and call to our assistance some helpers whom you say shall i call upon shall it be this man or that there is another choice also open to you you may go to the ancients for they have the time to help you we can get assistance not only from the living but from those of the past let us choose however from among the living not men who pour forth their words with the greatest glibness turning out commonplaces and holding as it were their own little private exhibitions not these i say but men who teach us by their lives men who tell us what we ought to do and then prove it by practice who show us what we should avoid and then are never caught doing that which they have ordered us to avoid choose as a guide one whom you will admire more when you see him act than when you hear him speak of course i would not prevent you from listening also to those philosophers who are wont to hold public meetings and discussions provided they appear before the people for the express purpose of improving themselves and others and do not practice their profession for the sake of self-seeking for what is baser than philosophy courting applause does the sick man praise the surgeon while he is operating in silence and with reverent awe 
submit to the cure. Even though you cry applause, I shall listen to your cries as if you were groaning when your sores were touched. Do you wish to bear witness that you are attentive? That you are stirred by the grandeur of the subject? You may do this at the proper time. I shall, of course, allow you to pass judgment and cast a vote as to the better course. Pythagoras made his pupils keep silence for five years. Do you think that they have the right, on that account, to break out immediately into applause? How mad is he who leaves the lecture room in a happy frame of mind simply because of applause from the ignorant? Why do you take pleasure in being praised by men whom you yourself cannot praise? Fabianus used to give popular talks, but his audience listened with self-control. Occasionally a loud shout of praise would burst forth, but it was prompted by the greatness of his subject, and not by the sound of oratory that slipped forth pleasantly and softly. There should be a difference between the applause of the theatre and the applause of the school. And there is a certain decency even in bestowing praise. If you mark them carefully, all acts are always significant, and you can gauge character by even the most trifling signs. The lecherous man is revealed by his gait, by a movement of the hand, sometimes by a single answer, by his touching his head with a finger, by the shifting of his eye. The scamp is shown up by his laugh, the madman by his face and general appearance. These qualities become known by certain marks. But you can tell the character of every man when you see how he gives and receives praise. The philosopher's audience, from this corner and that, stretch forth admiring hands, and sometimes the adoring crowd almost hang over the lecturer's head. But... If you really understand, that is not praise. It is merely applause. These outcries should be left for the arts which aim to please the crowd. Let philosophy be worshipped in silence. Young men, indeed, must sometimes have free play to follow their impulses, but it should only be at times when they act from impulse, and when they cannot force themselves to be silent. Such praise as that gives a certain kind of encouragement to the hearers themselves, and acts as a spur to the youthful mind. But let them be roused to the matter, and not to the style. Otherwise, eloquence does them harm, making them enamored of itself and not of the subject. I shall postpone this topic for the present. It demands a long and special investigation— to show how the public should be addressed, what indulgences should be allowed to a speaker on a public occasion, and what should be allowed to the crowd itself in the presence of the speaker. There can be no doubt that philosophy has suffered a loss now that she has exposed her charms for sale. But she can still be viewed in her sanctuary if her exhibitor is a priest and not a peddler. Farewell. End of letter 52, recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 53 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca, translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Faults of the Spirit You can persuade me into almost anything now, for I was recently persuaded to travel by water. We cast off when the sea was lazy smooth. The sky, to be sure, was heavy with nasty clouds, such as usually break into rain or squalls. Still, I thought that the few miles between Puteoli and your dear Parthenope might be run off in quick time, despite the uncertain and lowering sky. So in order to get away more quickly, I made straight out to sea for Nessis, with the purpose of cutting across all the inlets. But when we were so far out that it made little difference to me, whether I returned or kept on, the calm weather which had enticed me came to naught. The storm had not yet begun, but the ground swell was on, 
and the waves kept steadily coming faster. I began to ask the pilot to put me ashore somewhere. He replied that the coast was rough and a bad place to land, and that in a storm he feared a lee shore more than anything else. But I was suffering too grievously to think of the danger, since a sluggish seasickness which brought no relief was racking me, the sort that upsets the liver without clearing it. Therefore I laid down the law to my pilot, forcing him to make for the shore willy-nilly. When we drew near, I did not wait for things to be done in accordance with Virgil's orders, until prow faced seawards, or anchor plunged from bow. I remembered my profession, as a veteran devotee of cold water, and clad as I was in my cloak, let myself down into the sea just as a cold-water bather should. What do you think my feelings were, scrambling over the rocks, searching out the path, or making one for myself? I understood that sailors have good reason to fear the land. It is hard to believe what I endured when I could not endure myself. You may be sure that the reason why Ulysses was shipwrecked on every possible occasion was not so much because the sea-god was angry with him from his birth. He was simply subject to seasickness. And in the future I also, if I must go anywhere by sea, shall only reach my destination in the twentieth year. When I finally calmed my stomach, for you know that one does not escape seasickness by escaping from the sea and refreshed my body with a rub-down, I began to reflect how completely we forget or ignore our failings, even those that affect the body which are continually reminding us of their existence, not to mention those which are more serious in proportion as they are more hidden. A slight egg deceives us, but when it has increased and a genuine fever has begun to burn, it forces even a hardy man who can endure much suffering to admit that he is ill. There is a pain in the foot and a tingling sensation in the joints, but we still hide the complaint and announce that we have sprained a joint or else are tired from over-exercise. Then the ailment, uncertain at first, must be given a name, and when it begins to swell the ankles also and has made both our feet right feet, we are bound to confess that we have the gout. The opposite holds true of diseases of the soul. The worse one is, the less one perceives it. You need not be surprised, my beloved Lucilius, for he whose sleep is light pursues visions during slumber, and sometimes, though asleep, is conscious that he is asleep. But sound slumber annihilates our very dreams, and sinks the spirit down so deep that it has no perception of self. Why will no man confess his faults? Because he is still in their grasp. Only he who is awake can recount his dream, and similarly a confession of sin is a proof of sound mind. Let us therefore rouse ourselves that we may be able to correct our mistakes. Philosophy, however, is the only power that can stir us, the only power that can shake off our deep slumber. Devote yourself wholly to philosophy. You are worthy of her. She is worthy of you. Greet one another with a loving embrace. Say farewell to all other interests with courage and frankness. Do not study philosophy merely during your spare time. If you were ill, you would stop caring for your personal concerns and forget your business duties. You would not think highly enough of any client to take active charge of his case during a slight abatement of your sufferings. You would try your hardest to be rid of the illness as soon as possible. What then? Shall you not do the same thing now? throw aside all hindrances and give up your time to getting a sound mind. For no man can attain it if he is engrossed in other matters. Philosophy wields her own authority. She appoints her own time and does not allow it to be appointed for her. 
she is not a thing to be followed at odd times, but a subject for daily practice. She is mistress, and she commands our attendance. Alexander, when a certain state promised him a part of its territory and half its entire property, replied, I invaded Asia with the intention not of accepting what you might give, but of allowing you to keep what I might leave. Philosophy likewise keeps saying to all occupations, I do not intend to accept the time which you have left over, but I shall allow you to keep what I myself shall leave. Turn to her, therefore, with all your soul. Sit at her feet, cherish her. A great distance will then begin to separate you from other men. You will be far ahead of all mortals, and even the gods will not be far ahead of you. Do you ask what will be the difference between yourself and the gods? They will live longer, but by my faith it is the sign of a great artist to have confined a full likeness to the limits of a miniature. The wise man's life spreads out to him over as large a surface as does all eternity to a god. There is one point in which the sage has an advantage over the god. For a god is freed from terrors by the bounty of nature, the wise man by his own bounty. What a wonderful privilege to have the weakness of a man and the serenity of a god. The power of philosophy to blunt the blows of chance is beyond belief. No missile can settle in her body. She is well protected and impenetrable. She spoils the force of some missiles and wards them off with the loose folds of her gown, as if they had no power to harm. Others she dashes aside and hurls them back with such force that they recoil upon the sender. Farewell. End of letter 53. Recording by John Van Stan. Savannah, Georgia. Letter 54 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Aeneas Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Asthma and Death. My ill health had allowed me a long furlough, when suddenly it resumed the attack. What kind of ill health, you say? And surely you have a right to ask, for it is true that no kind is unknown to me. But I have been consigned, so to speak, to one special ailment. I do not know why I should call it by its Greek name, for it is well enough described as shortness of breath. Its attack is of very brief duration, like that of a squall at sea. It usually ends within an hour. Who indeed could breathe his last for long? I have passed through all the ills and dangers of the flesh, but nothing seems to me more troublesome than this. And naturally so, for anything else may be called illness. But this is a sort of continued last gasp. Hence physicians call it practicing how to die. For some day the breath will succeed in doing what it has so often essayed. Do you think I am writing this letter in a merry spirit, just because I have escaped? It would be absurd to take delight in such supposed restoration to health, as it would be for a defendant to imagine that he had won his case when he had succeeded in postponing his trial. Yet, in the midst of my difficult breathing, I never cease to rest secure in cheerful and brave thoughts. What, I say to myself, does death so often test me? Let it do so. I myself have for a long time tested death. When, you ask, before I was born. Death is non-existence. And I know already what that means. What was before me will happen again after me. If there is any suffering in this state, there must have been such suffering also in the past, before we entered the light of day. As a matter of fact, however, we felt no discomfort then. 
and i ask you would you not say that one was the greatest of fools who believed that a lamp was worse off when it was extinguished than before it was lighted we mortals also are lighted and extinguished the period of suffering comes in between but on either side there is a deep peace for unless i am very much mistaken my dear lucilius we go astray in thinking that death only follows when in reality it has both preceded us and will in turn follow us whatever condition existed before our birth is death for what does it matter whether you do not begin at all or whether you leave off inasmuch as the result of both these states is non-existence i have never ceased to encourage myself with cheering counsels of this kind silently of course since i had not the power to speak then little by little this shortness of breath already reduced to a sort of panting came on at greater intervals and then slowed down and finally stopped even by this time although the gasping has ceased the breath does not come and go normally i still feel a sort of hesitation and delay in breathing let it be as it pleases provided there be no sigh from the soul accept this assurance from me i shall never be frightened when the last hour comes i am already prepared and do not plan a whole day ahead but do you praise and imitate the man whom it does not irk to die though he takes pleasure in living for what virtue is there in going away when you are thrust out and yet there is virtue even in this i am indeed thrust out but it is as if i were going away willingly for that reason the wise man can never be thrust out because that would mean removal from a place which he is unwilling to leave and the wise man does nothing unwillingly he escapes necessity because he wills to do what necessity is about to force upon him farewell end of letter 54 recording by john van stan savannah georgia letter 55 of moral letters to lucilius by lucius anias seneca translated by richard m gummier this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Vatia's Villa I have just returned from a ride in my litter, and I am as weary as if I had walked the distance instead of being seated. Even to be carried for any length of time is hard work, perhaps all the more so because it is an unnatural exercise. For nature gave us legs with which to do our own walking, and eyes with which to do our own seeing our luxuries have condemned us to weakness we have ceased to be able to do that which we have long declined to do nevertheless i found it necessary to give my body a shaking up in order that the bile which had gathered in my throat if that was my trouble might be shaken out or if the very breath within me had become for some reason too thick that the jolting which i have felt was a good thing for me might make it thinner so i insisted on being carried longer than usual along an attractive beach which bends between cume and servilius vatia's country house shut in by the sea on one side and the lake on the other just like a narrow path it was packed firm underfoot because of a recent storm since as you know the waves when they beat upon the beach hard and fast level it out but a continuous period of fair weather loosens it, when the sand which is kept firm by the water loses its moisture. As my habit is, I began to look about for something there that might be of service to me, when my eyes fell upon the villa which had once belonged to Vatia. So this was the place where that famous praetorian millionaire passed his old age. He was famed for nothing else than his life of leisure, and he was regarded as lucky only for that reason for whenever men were ruined by their friendship with asinius gallus whenever others were ruined by their hatred of sehenus and later by their intimacy with him for it was no more dangerous to have offended him than to have loved him 
people used to cry out, Oh, Vatia, you alone know how to live. But what he knew was how to hide, not how to live. And it makes a great deal of difference whether your life be one of leisure or one of idleness. So I never drove past his country place during Vatia's lifetime without saying to myself, Here lies Vatia. But, my dear Lucilius, philosophy is a thing of holiness, something to be worshipped, so much so that the very counterfeit pleases. For the mass of mankind consider that a person is at leisure who has withdrawn from society, is free from care, self-sufficient, and lives for himself. But these privileges can be the reward only of the wise man. Does he who is a victim of anxiety know how to live for himself? What? Does he even know, and that is of first importance, how to live at all? For the man who has fled from affairs and from men, who has been banished to seclusion by the unhappiness which his own desires have brought upon him, who cannot see his neighbor more happy than himself, who, through fear, has taken to concealment like a frightened and sluggish animal, this person is not living for himself. He is living for his belly, his sleep, and his lust. And that is the most shameful thing in the world. He who lives for no one does not necessarily live for himself. Nevertheless, there is so much in steadfastness and adherence to one's purpose that even sluggishness, if stubbornly maintained, assumes an air of authority with us. I could not describe the villa accurately, for I am familiar only with the front of the house and with the parts which are in public view and can be seen by the mere passer-by. There are two grottoes, which cost a great deal of labor, as big as the most spacious hall made by hand. One of these does not admit the rays of the sun, while the other keeps them until the sun sets. There is also a stream running through a grove of plane trees which draws for its supply both on the sea and on Lake Acheron. It intersects the grove just like a raceway, and is large enough to support fish, although its waters are continually being drawn off. When the sea is calm, however, they do not use the stream, only touching the well-stocked waters when the storms give the fishermen a forced holiday. But the most convenient thing about the villa is the fact that Baia is next door. It is free from all the inconveniences of that resort, and yet enjoy its pleasures. I myself understand these attractions, and I believe that it is a villa suited to every season of the year. It fronts the west wind, which it intercepts in such a way that Baia is denied it. So it seems that Vatia was no fool when he selected this place as the best in which to spend his leisure, when it was already unfruitful and decrepit. The place where one lives, however, can contribute little toward tranquillity. It is the mind which must make everything agreeable to itself. I have seen men despondent in a gay and lovely villa, and I have seen them to all appearance full of business in the midst of a solitude. For this reason, you should not refuse to believe that your life is well placed, merely because you are not now in Campania. But why are you not there? Just let your thoughts travel even to this place. You may hold converse with your friends when they are absent, and indeed as often as you wish and for as long as you wish. For we enjoy this, the greatest of pleasures, all the more when we are absent from one another. For the presence of friends makes us fastidious, and because we can at any time talk or sit together, when once we have parted, we give not a thought to those whom we have just beheld. And we ought to bear the absence of friends cheerfully, just because every one is bound to be often absent from his friends, even when they are present. Include among such cases, in the first place, the nights spent apart, then the different engagements which each of two friends has, then the private studies of each, and their excursions into the country, and you will see that foreign travel does not rob us of much. A friend should be retained in the spirit, 
such a friend can never be absent. He can see every day whomsoever he desires to see. I would therefore have you share your studies with me, your meals and your walks. We should be living within two narrow limits if anything were barred to our thoughts. I see you, my dear Lucilius, and at this very moment I hear you. I am with you to such an extent that I hesitate whether I should not begin to write you notes instead of letters. Farewell. End of Letter 55 Recording by John Van Stan Savannah, Georgia Letter 56 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca Translated by Richard M. Gummier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Quiet and Study Beshrew me! If I think anything more requisite than silence for a man who secludes himself in order to study. Imagine what a variety of noises reverberates about my ears. I have lodgings right over a bathing establishment. So picture to yourself the assortment of sounds, which are strong enough to make me hate my very powers of hearing. When your strenuous gentleman, for example, is exercising himself by flourishing leaden weights. When he is working hard, or else pretends to be working, I can hear him grunt. And whenever he releases his imprisoned breath, I can hear him panting in wheezy and high-pitched tones. Or perhaps I notice some lazy fellow, content with a cheap rub-down, and hear the crack of the pummeling hand on his shoulder, varying in sound according as the hand is laid on flat or hollow. Then, uh, perhaps, a professional comes along, shouting out the score. That is the finishing touch. Add to this the arresting of an occasional roisterer or pickpocket, the racket of the man who always likes to hear his own voice in the bathroom, or the enthusiast who plunges into the swimming tank with unconscionable noise and splashing. Besides all those whose voices if nothing else, are good. Imagine the hair-plucker with his penetrating shrill voice, for purposes of advertisement, continually giving it vent, and never holding his tongue except when he is plucking the armpits and making his victim yell instead. Then the cake-seller with his varied cries, the sausage-man, the confectioner, and all the vendors of food hawking their wares, each with his own distinctive intonation. So you say, what iron nerves or deadened ears you must have, if your mind can hold out amid so many noises, so various and so discordant when our friend Chrysippus is brought to his death by the continual good morrows that greet him. But I assure you that this racket means no more to me than the sound of waves or falling water. Although you will remind me that a certain tribe once moved their city merely because they could not endure the din of a Nile cataract. Words seem to distract me more than noises, for words demand attention, but noises merely fill the ears and beat upon them. Among the sounds that din round me without distracting, I include passing carriages, a machinist in the same block, a saw-sharpener nearby, or some fellow who is demonstrating with little pipes and flutes at the trickling fountain, shouting rather than singing. Furthermore, an intermittent noise upsets me more than a steady one. But by this time I have toughened my nerves against all that sort of thing, so that I can endure even a boatswain marking the time in high-pitched tones for his crew. For I force my mind to concentrate." and keep it from straying to things outside itself. All outdoors may be bedlam, provided that there is no disturbance within, provided that fear is not wrangling with desire in my breast, provided that meanness and lavishness are not at odds, one harassing the other. For of what benefit is a quiet neighborhood if our emotions are in an uproar? "'Twas night, and all the world was lulled to rest. "'This is not true, for no real rest can be found "'when reason has not done the lulling. 
night brings our troubles to the light rather than banishes them it merely changes the form of our worries for even when we seek slumber our sleepless moments are as harassing as the daytime real tranquillity is the state reached by an unperverted mind when it is relaxed think of the unfortunate man who courts sleep by surrendering his spacious mansion to silence who that his ear may be disturbed by no sound bids the whole retinue of his slaves be quiet and that whoever approaches him shall walk on tiptoe he tosses from this side to that and seeks a fitful slumber amid his frettings he complains that he has heard sounds when he has not heard them at all the reason you ask his soul is in an uproar it must be soothed and its rebellious murmuring checked you need not suppose that the soul is at peace when the body is still sometimes quiet means disquiet we must therefore rouse ourselves to action and busy ourselves with interests that are good as often as we are in the grasp of an uncontrollable sluggishness great generals when they see that their men are mutinous check them by some sort of labor or keep them busy with small forays the much occupied man has no time for wantonness and it is an obvious commonplace that the evils of leisure can be shaken off by hard work although people may often have thought that i sought seclusion because i was disgusted with politics and regretted my hapless and thankless position yet in the retreat to which apprehension and weariness have driven me my ambition sometimes develops afresh for it is not because my ambition was rooted out that it has abated but because it was wearied or perhaps even put out of temper by the failure of its plans and so with luxury also which sometimes seems to have departed and then when we have made a profession of frugality begins to fret us and amid our economies seeks the pleasures which we have merely left but not condemned indeed the more stealthily it comes the greater is its force for all unconcealed vices are less serious a disease also is farther on the road to being cure when it breaks forth from concealment and manifests its power so with greed ambition and the other evils of the mind you may be sure that they do most harm when they are hidden behind a pretense of soundness men think that we are in retirement and yet we are not for if we have sincerely retired and have sounded the signal for retreat and have scorned outward attractions then as i remarked above no outward thing will distract us no music of men or birds can interrupt good thoughts when they have once become steadfast and sure the mind which starts at words or at chance sounds is unstable and has not yet withdrawn into itself it contains within itself an element of anxiety and rooted fear and this makes one a prey to care as our virgil says i whom of yore no dart could cause to flee nor greeks with crowded lines of infantry now shake at every sound and fear the air both for my child and for the load i bear this man in his first state is wise he blenches neither at the brandished spear nor at the clashing armor of the serried foe nor at the din of the stricken city this man is in his second state lacks knowledge fearing for his own concerns he pales at every sound any cry is taken for the battle shout and overthrows him the slightest disturbance renders him breathless with fear it is the load that makes him afraid select any one you please from among your favorites of fortune trailing their many responsibilities carrying their many burdens and you will behold a picture of virgil's hero fearing both for his child and for the load he bears you may therefore be sure that you are at peace with yourself 
when no noise reaches you, when no word shakes you out of yourself, whether it be of flattery or of threat, or merely an empty sound buzzing about you with unmeaning din. What then, you say, is it not sometimes a simpler matter just to avoid the uproar? I admit this. Accordingly, I shall change from my present quarters. I merely wish to test myself and to give myself practice. Why need I be tormented any longer, when Ulysses found so simple a cure for his comrades, even against the songs of the sirens? Farewell. End of letter 56. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 57 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Trials of Travel When it was time for me to return to Naples from Baia, I easily persuaded myself that a storm was raging, that I might avoid another trip by sea, and yet the road was so deep in mud all the way that I may be thought none the less to have made a voyage. On that day I had to endure the full fate of an athlete. The anointing with which we began was followed by the sand sprinkle in the Naples tunnel. No place could be longer than that prison. Nothing could be dimmer than those torches which enabled us not to see amid the darkness, but to see the darkness. But... Even supposing that there was light in the place, the dust, which is an oppressive and disagreeable thing even in the open air, would destroy the light. How much worse the dust is there, where it rolls back upon itself, and being shut in without ventilation, blows back in the faces of those who set it going. So we endured two inconveniences at the same time and they were diametrically different. We struggled both with mud and with dust on the same road and on the same day. The gloom, however, furnished me with some food for thought. I felt a certain mental thrill, and a transformation unaccompanied by fear, due to the novelty and the unpleasantness of an unusual occurrence. Of course, I am not speaking to you of myself at this point, because I am far from being a perfect person or even a man of middling qualities. I refer to one over whom fortune has lost her control. Even such a man's mind will be smitten with a thrill, and he will change color. For there are certain emotions, my dear Lucilius, which no courage can avoid. Nature reminds courage how perishable a thing it is and so he will contract his brow when the prospect is forbidding, will shudder at sudden apparitions, and will become dizzy when he stands at the edge of a high precipice and looks down. This is not fear. It is a natural feeling which reason cannot rout. That is why certain brave men, most willing to shed their own blood, cannot bear to see the blood of others. Some persons collapse and faint at the sight of a freshly inflicted wound. Others are affected similarly on handling or viewing an old wound which is festering. And others meet the sword-stroke more readily than they see it dealt. Accordingly, as I said, I experienced a certain transformation, though it could not be called confusion. Then, at the first glimpse of restored daylight, my good spirits returned without forethought or command, and I began to muse and think how foolish we are to fear certain objects to a greater or less degree, since all of them end in the same way. For what difference does it make whether a watchtower or a mountain crashes down upon us? No difference at all, you will find. Nevertheless, there will be some men who fear the latter mishap to a greater degree, though both accidents are equally deadly. So true it is that fear looks not to the effect, but to the cause of the effect. Do you suppose that I am now referring to the Stoics, who hold that the soul of a man crushed by a great weight cannot abide, and is scattered forthwith, because it has not had a free opportunity to depart? That is not what I am doing. 
those who think thus are, in my opinion, wrong. Just as fire cannot be crushed out, since it will escape round the edges of the body which overwhelms it, just as the air cannot be damaged by lashes and blows, or even cut into, but flows back about the object to which it gives place. Similarly, the soul, which consists of the subtlest particles, cannot be arrested or destroyed inside the body. But by virtue of its delicate substance, it will rather escape through the very object by which it is being crushed. Just as lightning, no matter how widely it strikes and flashes, makes its return through a narrow opening, so the soul, which is still subtler than fire, has a way of escape through any part of the body. We therefore come to this question, whether the soul can be immortal. But be sure of this, if the soul survives the body after the body is crushed, the soul can in no wise be crushed out, precisely because it does not perish. For the rule of immortality never admits of exceptions, and nothing can harm that which is everlasting. Farewell. End of Letter 57 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Letter 58 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca Translated by Richard M. Gummier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Being How scant of words are languages, nay, how poverty-stricken, I have not fully understood until today. We happen to be speaking of Plato, and a thousand subjects came up for discussion, which needed names, and yet possessed none. And there were certain others which once possessed, but have since lost, their words because we were too nice about their use. But who can endure to be nice in the midst of poverty? There is an insect, called by the Greeks ostrus, which drives cattle wild and scatters them all over their pasturing grounds. It used to be called Asilus in our language, as you may believe on the authority of Virgil. Near Silurus groves and Eca Albernus's shades, of green-clad oak trees flits an insect named Asilus by the Romans. In the Greek the word is rendered ostrus. With a rough and strident sound it buzzes and drives wild the terror-stricken herds throughout the woods. By which I infer that the word has gone out of use. And, not to keep you waiting too long, there were certain uncompounded words current, like Cenere ferro interse, as will be proved again by Virgil. Great heroes, born in various lands, had come to settle matters mutually with the sword. This settling matters we now express by decenere. The plain word has become obsolete. The ancients used to say uiso instead of uicero in conditional clauses. You need not take my word, but you may turn again to Virgil. The other soldiers shall conduct the fight with me where I shall bid. It is not in my purpose to show, by this array of examples, how much time I have wasted on the study of language. I merely wish you to understand how many words that were current in the works of Aeneas and Asius have become moldy with age, while even in the case of Virgil, whose works are explored daily, some of his words have been uh, filched away from us. You will say, I suppose, what is the purpose and meaning of this preamble? I shall not keep you in the dark. I desire, if possible, to say the word essentia to you, and obtain a favorable hearing. If I cannot do this, I shall risk it even though it put you out of humor. I have Cicero as authority for the use of this word, and I regard him as a powerful authority. If you desire testimony of a later date, I shall cite Fabianus, careful of speech, cultivated, and so polished in style that he will suit even our nice tastes. For what can we do, my dear Lucilius? 
How otherwise can we find a word for that which the Greeks call Uivia? Something that is indispensable, something that is the natural substratum of everything? I beg you accordingly to allow me to use this word, essentia. I shall nevertheless take pains to exercise the privilege which you have granted me, with as sparing a hand as possible. Perhaps I shall be content with the mere right. Yet, what good will your indulgence do me if, lo and behold, I can in no wise express in Latin the meaning of the word which gave me the opportunity to rail at the poverty of our language? And you will condemn our narrow Roman limits even more when you find out that there is a word of one syllable which I cannot translate. What is this? you ask. It is the word of. You think me lacking in facility? You believe that the word is ready to hand, that it might be translated by coedest? I noticed, however, a great difference. You are forcing me to render a noun by a verb. But if I must do so, I shall render it by quid est. There are six ways in which Plato expresses this idea, according to a friend of ours, a man of great learning, who mentioned the fact today. And I shall explain all of them to you, if I may first point out that there is something called genus and something called species. For the present, however, we are seeking the primary idea of genus on which the others, the different species, depend, which is the source of all classification, the term under which universal ideas are embraced. And the idea of genus will be reached if we begin to reckon back from particulars, for in this way we shall be conducted back to the primary notion. Now, man is a species, as Aristotle says, so is horse or dog, we must therefore discover some common bond for all these terms, one which embraces them and holds them subordinate to itself. And what is this? It is animal. And so there begins to be a genus, animal, including all these terms, man, horse, and dog. But there are certain things which have life, anima, and yet are not animals for it is agreed that plants and trees possess life, and that is why we speak of them as living and dying. Therefore, the term living things will occupy a still higher place, because both animals and plants are included in this category. Certain objects, however, lack life, such as rocks. There will therefore be another term to take precedence over living things, and that is substance. I shall classify substance by saying that all substances are either animate or inanimate. But there is still something superior to substance, for we speak of certain things as possessing substance and certain things as lacking substance. What then will be the term from which these things are derived? It is that to which we lately gave an inappropriate name, that which exists. For by using this term they will be divided into species, so that we can say that which exists either possesses or lacks substance. This therefore is what genus is. The primary, original, and to play upon the word, general. Of course there are the other genera, but they are special genera, man being, for example, a genus. For man comprises species by nations, Greek, Roman, Parthian, by colors, white, black, yellow. The term comprises individuals also, Catero, Cicero, Lucretius. So man falls into the category genus insofar as it includes many kinds. But insofar as it is subordinate to another term, it falls into the category species but the genus, that which exists, is general, and has no term superior to it. It is the first term in the classification of things, and all things are included under it. The Stoics would set ahead of this still another genus, even more primary, concerning which I shall immediately speak, 
after proving that the genus which has been discussed above has rightly been placed first being as it is capable of including everything i therefore distribute that which exists into these two species things with and things without substance there is no third class and how do i distribute substance by saying that it is either animate or inanimate and how do i distribute the animate by saying certain things have mind while others have only life or the idea may be expressed as follows certain things have the power of movement of progress of change of position while others are rooted in the ground they are fed and they grow only through their roots again into what species do i divide animals they are either perishable or imperishable certain of the stoics regard the primary genus as the something i shall add the reasons they give for their belief they say in the order of nature some things exist and other things do not exist and even the things that do not exist are really part of the order of nature what these are will readily occur to the mind for example centaurs giants and all other figments of unsound reasoning which have begun to have a definite shape although they have no bodily consistency but i now return to the subject which i promised to discuss for you namely how it is that plato divides all existing things in six different ways the first class of that which exists cannot be grasped by the sight or by the touch or by any of the senses but it can be grasped by the thought any generic conception such as the generic idea man does not come within the range of the eyes but man in particular does as for example cicero cato the term animal is not seen it is grasped by thought alone a particular animal however is seen for example a horse a dog the second class of things which exist according to plato is that which is prominent and stands out above everything else this he says exists in a preeminent degree the word poet is used indiscriminately for this term is applied to all writers of verse but among the greeks it has come to be the distinguishing mark of a single individual you know that homer is meant when you hear men say the poet what then is this preeminent being god surely one who is greater and more powerful than any one else the third class is made up of those things which exist in the proper sense of the term they are countless in number but are situated beyond our sight what are these you ask they are plato's own furniture so to speak he calls them ideas and from them all visible things are created and according to their pattern all things are fashioned they are immortal unchangeable inviolable and this idea or rather plato's conception of it is as follows the idea is the everlasting pattern of those things which are created by nature i shall explain this definition in order to set the subject before you in a clearer light suppose that i wish to make a likeness of you i possess in your own person the pattern of this picture wherefrom my mind receives a certain outline which it is to embody in its own handiwork that outward appearance then which gives me instruction and guidance this pattern for me to imitate is the idea such patterns therefore nature possesses in infinite number of men fish trees according to whose model everything that nature has to create is worked out in the fourth place we shall put form and if you would know what form means you must pay close attention calling plato and not me to account for the difficulty of the subject however we cannot make fine distinctions without encountering difficulties a moment ago i made use of the artist as an illustration when the artist desired to reproduce virgil in colors he would gaze upon virgil himself 
the idea was Virgil's outward appearance, and this was the pattern of the intended work. That which the artist draws from this idea and has embodied in his own work is the form. Do you ask me where the difference lies? The former is the pattern, while the latter is the shape taken from the pattern and embodied in the work. Our artist follows the one, but the other he creates. A statue has a certain external appearance. This external appearance of the statue is the form, and the pattern itself has a certain external appearance, by gazing upon which the sculptor has fashioned his statue. This is the idea. If you desire a further distinction, I will say that the form is in the artist's work, the idea outside his work, and not only outside it, but prior to it. The fifth class is made up of the things which exist in the usual sense of the term. These things are the first that have to do with us. Here we have all such things as men, cattle, and things. In the sixth class goes all that which has a fictitious existence, like void or time. Whatever is concrete to the sight or touch, Plato does not include among the things which he believes to be existent in the strict sense of this term. These things are the first that have to do with us. Here we have all such things as men, cattle, and things, for they are in a state of flux, constantly diminishing or increasing. None of us is the same man in old age that he was in youth, nor the same on the morrow as on the day preceding. Our bodies are hurried along like flowing waters. Every visible object accompanies time in its flight. Of the things which we see, nothing is fixed. Even I myself, as I comment on this change, am changed myself. This is just what Heraclitus says. We go down twice into the same river, and yet into a different river. For the stream still keeps the same name, but the water has already flowed past. Of course, this is much more evident in rivers than in human beings. Still, we mortals are also carried past in no less speedy a course, and this prompts me to marvel at our madness in cleaving with great affection to such a fleeting thing as the body and in fearing lest some day we may die, when every instant means the death of our previous condition. Will you not stop fearing, lest that may happen once which really happens every day? So much for man. A substance that flows away and falls, exposed to every influence. But the universe too, immortal and enduring as it is, changes and never remains the same. For, though it has within itself all that it has had, it has in it a different way from that in which it has had it. It keeps changing its arrangement. Very well, say you, what good shall I get from all this fine reasoning? None, if you wish me to answer your question. Nevertheless, just as an engraver rests his eyes when they have long been under a strain and are weary, and calls them from their work, and feasts them, as the saying is, so we at times should slacken our minds, and refresh them with some sort of entertainment. But let even your entertainment be work. And even from these various forms of entertainment you will select, if you have been watchful, something that may prove wholesome. That is my habit, Lucilius. I try to extract and render useful some element from every field of thought, no matter how far removed it may be from philosophy. Now, what could be less likely to reform character than the subjects which we have been discussing? And how can I be made a better man by the ideas of Plato? What can I draw from them that will put a check on my appetites? Perhaps the very thought that all these things which minister to our senses, which arouse and excite us, are by Plato denied a place among the things that really exist. Such things are therefore imaginary, and though they, for the moment, present a certain external appearance, yet they are in no case permanent or substantial. Nonetheless, we crave them as if they were always to exist, 
or as if we were always to possess them. We are weak, watery beings standing in the midst of unrealities. Therefore, let us turn our minds to the things that are everlasting. Let us look up to the ideal outlines of all things that flit about on high, and to the God who moves among them and plans how he may defend from death that which he could not make imperishable because its substance forbade, and so by reason may overcome the defects of the body. For all things abide not because they are everlasting, but because they are protected by the care of him who governs all things. But that which was imperishable would need no guardian. The master builder keeps them safe, overcoming the weakness of their fabric by his own power. Let us despise everything that is so little an object of value that it makes us doubt whether it exists at all. Let us at the same time reflect, seeing that providence rescues from its perils the world itself, which is no less mortal than we ourselves, that to some extent our petty bodies can be made to tarry longer upon earth by our own providence, if only we acquire the ability to control and check those pleasures whereby the greater portion of mankind perishes. Plato himself, by taking pains, advanced to old age. To be sure, he was the fortunate possessor of a strong and sound body. His very name was given him because of his broad chest. But his strength was much impaired by sea voyages and desperate adventures. Nevertheless, by frugal living, by setting a limit upon all that rouses the appetites, and by painstaking attention to himself, he reached that advanced age in spite of many hindrances. You know, I am sure, that Plato had the good fortune, thanks to his careful living, to die on his birthday, after exactly completing his eighty-first year. For this reason, wise men of the East, who happened to be in Athens at that time, sacrificed to him after his death, believing that his length of days was too full for a mortal man, since he had rounded out the perfect number of nine times nine. I do not doubt that he would have been quite willing to forego a few days from this total, as well as the sacrifice. Frugal living can bring one to old age, and to my mind, old age is not to be refused any more than it is to be craved. There is a pleasure in being in one's own company as long as possible, when a man has made himself worth enjoying. The question, therefore, on which we have to record our judgment is, whether one should shrink from extreme old age and should hasten the end artificially, instead of waiting for it to come. A man who sluggishly awaits his fate is almost a coward, just as he is immoderately given to wine who drains the jar dry and sucks up even the dregs. But we shall ask this question also. Is the extremity of life the dregs? Or is it the clearest and purest part of all, provided only that the mind is unimpaired, and the senses still sound give their support to the spirit, and the body is not worn out and dead before its time? For it makes a great deal of difference whether a man is lengthening his life or his death. But if the body is useless for service, why should one not free the struggling soul? Perhaps one ought to do this a little before the debt is due, lest, when it falls due, he may be unable to perform the act. And since the danger of living in wretchedness is greater than the danger of dying soon, he is a fool who refuses to stake a little time and win a hazard of great gain. Few have lasted through extreme old age to death without impairment, and many have lain inert, making no use of themselves. How much more cruel, then, do you suppose it really is to have lost a portion of your life than to have lost your right to end that life? Do not hear me with reluctance, as if my statement applied directly to you, but weigh what I have to say. It is this, that I shall not abandon old age, if old age preserves me intact for myself, and intact as regards the better part of myself. But 
if old age begins to shatter my mind and to pull its various faculties to pieces, if it leaves me not life, but only the breath of life, I shall rush out of a house that is crumbling and tottering. I shall not avoid illness by seeking death, as long as the illness is curable and does not impede my soul. I shall not lay violent hands upon myself just because I am in pain, for death under such circumstances is defeat. But if I find out that the pain must always be endured, I shall depart, not because of the pain, but because it will be a hindrance to me as regards all my reasons for living. He who dies just because he is in pain is a weakling, a coward. But he who lives merely to brave out this pain is a fool. But I am running on too long, and besides, there is matter here to fill a day, and how can a man end his life if he cannot end a letter? So farewell. This last word you will read with greater pleasure than all my deadly talk about death. Farewell. End of letter 58. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 59 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annaeus Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Pleasure and joy. I received great pleasure from your letter. Kindly allow me to use these words in their everyday meaning, without insisting upon their stoic import. For we stoics hold that pleasure is a vice. Very likely it is a vice. But we are accustomed to use the word when we wish to indicate a happy state of mind. I am aware that if we test words by our formula, even pleasure is a thing of ill repute, and joy can be attained only by the wise. For joy is an elation of spirit, of a spirit which trusts in the goodness and truth of its own possessions. The common usage, however, is that we derive great joy from a friend's position as consul, or from his marriage, or from the birth of his child. But these events, so far from being matters of joy, are more often the beginnings of sorrow to come. No. It is a characteristic of real joy that it never ceases and never changes into its opposite. Accordingly, when our Virgil speaks of the evil joys of the mind, his words are eloquent, but not strictly appropriate, for no joy can be evil. He has given the name joy to pleasures and has thus expressed his meaning, for he has conveyed the idea that men take delight in their own evil. Nevertheless, I was not wrong in saying that I received great pleasure from your letter. For although an ignorant man may derive joy, if the cause be an honorable one, yet, since his emotion is wayward, and is likely soon to take another direction, I call it pleasure. For it is inspired by an opinion concerning a spurious good. It exceeds control, and is carried to excess. But, to return to the subject, let me tell you what delighted me in your letter. You have your words under control. You are not carried away by your language, or born beyond the limits which you have determined upon. Many writers are tempted by the charm of some alluring phrase to some topic other than that which they had set themselves to discuss. But this has not been so in your case. All your words are compact and suited to the subject. You say all that you wish, and you mean still more than you say. This is a proof of the importance of your subject matter, showing that your mind, as well as your words, contains nothing superfluous or bombastic. I do, however, find some metaphors, not indeed daring ones, but the kind which have stood the test of use. I find similes also, of course, if any one forbids to use them, maintaining that poets alone have that privilege, he has not apparently read any of our ancient prose writers, who had not yet learned to affect a style that should win applause. For those writers, whose eloquence was simple and directed only toward proving their case, are full of comparisons, and I think that these are necessary. 
not for the same reason which makes them necessary for the poets, but in order that they may serve as props to our feebleness, to bring both speaker and listener face to face with the subject under discussion. For example, I am at this very moment reading Sextius. He is a keen man and a philosopher who, though he writes in Greek, has the Roman standard of ethics. One of his similes appealed especially to me, that of an army marching in hollow square, in a place where the enemy might be expected to appear from any quarter, ready for battle. This, said he, is just what the wise man ought to do. He should have all his fighting qualities deployed on every side, so that wherever the attack threatens, there his supports may be ready to hand and may obey the captain's command without confusion. This is what we notice in armies which serve under great leaders. We see how all the troops simultaneously understand their general's orders, since they are so arranged that a signal given by one man passes down the ranks of cavalry and infantry at the same moment. This, he declares, is still more necessary for men like ourselves. For soldiers have often feared an enemy without reason, and the march which they thought most dangerous has in fact been most secure. But folly brings no repose. Fear haunts it both in the van and in the rear of the column, and both flanks are in a panic. Folly is pursued and confronted by peril. It blenches at everything. It is unprepared. It is frightened even by auxiliary troops. But the wise man is fortified against all inroads. He is alert. He will not retreat before the attack of poverty, or of sorrow, or of disgrace, or of pain. He will walk undaunted both against them and among them. We human beings are fettered and weakened by many vices. We have wallowed in them for a long time, and it is hard for us to be cleansed. We are not merely defiled, we are dyed by them. But to refrain from passing from one figure to another, I will raise this question which I often consider in my own heart. Why is it that folly holds us with such an insistent grasp? It is, primarily, because we do not combat it strongly enough because we do not struggle towards salvation with all our might. Secondly, because we do not put sufficient trust in the discoveries of the wise, and do not drink in their words with open hearts. We approach this great problem in too trifling a spirit. But how can a man learn in the struggle against his vices an amount that is enough, if the time which he gives to learning is only the amount left over from his vices? None of us goes deep below the surface. We skim the top only, and we regard the smattering of time spent in the search for wisdom as enough and to spare for a busy man. What hinders us most of all is that we are too readily satisfied with ourselves. If we meet with someone who calls us good men, or sensible men, or holy men, we see ourselves in this description. Not content with praise and moderation, we accept everything that shameless flattery heaps upon us, as if it were our due. We agree with those who declare us to be the best and wisest of men, although we know that they are given to much lying. And we are so self-complacent that we desire praise for certain actions when we are especially addicted to the very opposite. Yonder person hears himself called most gentle when he is inflicting tortures, or most generous when he is engaged in looting, or most temperate when he is in the midst of drunkenness and lust. Thus it follows that we are unwilling to be reformed, just because we believe ourselves to be the best of men. Alexander was roaming as far as India ravaging tribes that were but little known even to their neighbors. During the blockade of a certain city, while he was reconnoitering the walls and hunting for the weakest spot in the fortifications, he was wounded by an arrow. Nevertheless, he long continued the siege, intent on finishing what he had begun. The pain of his wound, however, 
as the surface became dry and as the flow of blood was checked increased his leg gradually became numb as he sat his horse and finally when he was forced to withdraw he exclaimed all men swear that i am the son of jupiter but this wound cries out that i am mortal let us also act in the same way each man according to his lot in life is stultified by flattery we should say to him who flatters us you call me a man of sense but i understand how many of these things which i crave are useless and how many of the things which i desire will do me harm i have not even the knowledge which satiety teaches to animals of what should be the measure of my food or my drink i do not yet know how much i can hold i shall now show you how you may know that you are not wise the wise man is joyful happy and calm unshaken he lives on a plain with the gods now go question yourself if you are never downcast if your mind is not harassed by any apprehension through anticipation of what is to come if day and night your soul keeps on its even and unswerving course upright and content with itself then you have attained to the greatest good that mortals can possess if however you seek pleasures of all kinds and all directions you must know that you are as far short of wisdom as you are short of joy joy is the goal which you desire to reach but you are wandering from the path if you expect to reach your goal while you are in the midst of riches and official titles in other words if you seek joy in the midst of cares these objects for which you strive so eagerly as if they would give you happiness and pleasure are merely causes of grief all men of this stamp i maintain are pressing on in pursuit of joy but they do not know where they may obtain a joy that is both great and enduring one person seeks it in feasting and self-indulgence another in canvassing for honors and in being surrounded by a throng of clients another in his mistress another in idle display of culture and in literature that has no power to heal all these men are led astray by delights which are deceptive and short-lived like drunkenness for example which pays for a single hour of hilarious madness by a sickness of many days or like applause and the popularity of enthusiastic approval which are gained and atoned for at the cost of great mental disquietude reflect therefore on this that the effect of wisdom is a joy that is unbroken and continuous the mind of a wise man is like the ultra-lunar firmament eternal calm pervades that region you have then a reason for wishing to be wise if the wise man is never deprived of joy this joy springs only from the knowledge that you possess the virtues none but the brave the just the self-restrained can rejoice and when you query what do you mean do not the foolish and the wicked also rejoice i reply no more than lions who have caught their prey when men have wearied themselves with wine and lust when night fails them before their debauch is done when the pleasures which they have heaped upon a body that is too small to hold them begin to fester at such times they utter in their wretchedness those lines of virgil thou knowest how amid false glittering joys we spent that last of nights pleasure lovers spend every night amid false glittering joys and just as if it were their last but the joy which comes to the gods and to those who imitate the gods is not broken off nor does it cease but it would surely cease were it borrowed from without just because it is not in the power of another to bestow neither is it subject to another's whims that which fortune has not given she cannot take away farewell end of letter fifty nine recording by john van stan savannah georgia letter sixty of moral letters to lucilius by lucius annaeus seneca translated by richard m gummier 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Harmful Prayers I file a complaint. I enter a suit. I am angry. Do you still desire what your nurse, your guardian, or your mother have prayed for in your behalf? Do you not yet understand what evil they prayed for? Alas, how hostile to us are the wishes of our own folk! And they are all the more hostile in proportion as they are more completely fulfilled. It is no surprise to me, at my age, that nothing but evil attends us from our early youth, for we have grown up amid the curses invoked by our parents. And may the gods give ear to our cry also, uttered in our own behalf, one which asks no favors. How long shall we go on making demands upon the gods, as if we were still unable to support ourselves? How long shall we continue to fill with grain the marketplaces of our great cities? How long must the people gather it in for us? How long shall many ships convey the requisites for a single meal, bringing them from no single sea? The bull is filled when he feeds over a few acres, and one forest is large enough for a herd of elephants. Man, however, draws sustenance both from the earth and from the sea. What, then? Did nature give us bellies so insatiable when she gave us these puny bodies that we should outdo the hugest and most voracious animals in greed? Not at all. How small is the amount which will satisfy nature? A very little will send her away contented. It is not the natural hunger of our bellies that costs us dear, but our solicitous cravings. Therefore, those who, as Sallust puts it, hearken to their bellies, should be numbered among the animals and not among men, and certain men indeed should be numbered not even among the animals, but among the dead. He really lives who is made use of by many. He really lives who makes use of himself. Those men, however, who creep into a hole and grow torpid are no better off in their homes than if they were in their tombs. Right there on the marble lintel of the house of such a man you may inscribe his name, for he has died before he is dead. Farewell. End of letter 60. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 61 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annius Seneca, translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Meeting Death Cheerfully Let us cease to desire that which we have been desiring. I, at least, am doing this. In my old age I have ceased to desire what I desired when a boy. To this single end my days and my nights are past. This is my task, this the object of my thoughts, to put an end to my chronic ills. I am endeavoring to live every day as if it were a complete life. I do not indeed snatch it up as if it were my last. I do regard it, however, as if it might even be my last. The present letter is written to you with this in mind. As if death were about to call me away in the very act of writing. I am ready to depart, and I shall enjoy life just because I am not over-anxious as to the future date of my departure. Before I became old, I tried to live well. Now that I am old, I shall try to die well. But dying well means dying gladly. See to it that you never do anything unwillingly. That which is bound to be a necessity if you rebel is not a necessity if you desire it. This is what I mean. He who takes his orders gladly escapes the bitterest part of slavery, doing what one does not want to do. The man who does something under orders is not unhappy. He is unhappy who does something against his will. Let us, therefore, so set our minds in order that we may desire whatever is demanded of us by circumstances and above all, that we may reflect upon our end without sadness. We must make ready for death 
before we make ready for life. Life is well enough furnished, but we are too greedy with regard to its furnishings. Something always seems to us lacking, and will always seem lacking. To have lived long enough depends neither upon our years nor upon our days, but upon our minds. I have lived, my dear friend Lucilius, long enough. I have had my fill. I await death. Farewell. End of letter 61. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 62 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annaeus Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Good Company we are deceived by those who would have us believe that a multitude of affairs blocks the pursuit of liberal studies they make a pretense of their engagements and multiply them when their engagements are merely with themselves as for me lucilius my time is free it is indeed free and wherever i am i am master of myself for i do not surrender myself to my affairs but loan myself to them, and I do not hunt out excuses for wasting my time. And wherever I am situated, I carry on my own meditations and ponder in my mind some wholesome thought. When I give myself to my friends, I do not withdraw from my own company, nor do I linger with those who are associated with me through some special occasion or some case which arises from my official position. But, I spend my time in the company of all the best. No matter in what lands they may have lived, or in what age, I let my thoughts fly to them. Demetrius, for instance, the best of men, I take about with me, and leaving the wearers of purple and fine linen, I talk with him, half-naked as he is, and hold him in high esteem. Why should I not hold him in high esteem? I have found that he lacks nothing. It is in the power of any man to despise all things, but of no man to possess all things. The shortest cut to riches is to despise riches. Our friend Demetrius, however, lives not merely as if he has learned to despise all things, but as if he has handed them over for others to possess. Farewell. End of letter 62 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 63 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Annaeus Seneca. Translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On Grief for Lost Friends I am grieved to hear that your friend Flaccus is dead. But I would not have you sorrow more than is fitting. That you should not mourn at all, I should hardly dare to insist, and yet I know that it is the better way. But what man will ever be so blessed with that ideal steadfastness of soul, unless he has already risen far above the reach of fortune? Even such a man will be stung by an event like this, but it will only be a sting. We, however, may be forgiven for bursting into tears if only our tears have not flowed to excess, and if we have checked them by our own efforts. Let not the eyes be dry when we have lost a friend, nor let them overflow. We may weep, but we must not wail. Do you think that the law which I lay down for you is harsh, when the greatest of Greek poets has extended the privilege of weeping to one day only, in the lines where he tells us that even Niobe took thought of food? Do you wish to know the reason for lamentations and excessive weeping? It is because we seek the proofs of our bereavement in our tears, and do not give way to sorrow, but merely parade it. No man goes into mourning for his own sake. Shame on our ill-timed folly! There is an element of self-seeking even in our sorrow. What, you say, am I to forget my friend? 
It is surely a short-lived memory that you vouchsafe to him, if it is to endure only as long as your grief. Presently, that brow of yours will be smoothed out in laughter by some circumstance, however casual. It is to a time no more distant than this that I put off the soothing of every regret, the quieting of even the bitterest grief. As soon as you cease to observe yourself, the picture of sorrow which you have contemplated will fade away. At present, you are keeping watch over your own suffering. But even while you keep watch, it slips away from you. And the sharper it is, the more speedily it comes to an end. Let us see to it that the recollection of those whom we have lost becomes a pleasant memory to us. No man reverts with pleasure to any subject which he will not be able to reflect upon without pain. So, too, it cannot but be that the names of those whom we have loved and lost come back to us with a sort of sting. But there is a pleasure even in this sting. For as my friend Adelis used to say, the remembrance of lost friends is pleasant in the same way that certain fruits have an agreeably acid taste or as in extremely old wines it is their very bitterness that pleases us. Indeed, after a certain lapse of time, every thought that gave pain is quenched, and the pleasure comes to us unalloyed. If we take the word of Adelis for it, to think of friends who are alive and well is like enjoying a meal of cakes and honey. The recollection of friends who have passed away gives us a pleasure that is not without a touch of bitterness. Yet who will deny that even these things, which are bitter and contain an element of sourness, do serve to arouse the stomach? For my part, I do not agree with him. To me, the thought of my dead friends is sweet and appealing. For I have had them as if I should one day lose them. I have lost them as if I have them still. Therefore, Lucilius, act as befits your own serenity of mind, and cease to put a wrong interpretation on the gifts of fortune. Fortune has taken away, but fortune has given. Let us greedily enjoy our friends, because we do not know how long this privilege will be ours. Let us think how often we shall leave them when we go upon distant journeys, and how often we shall fail to see them when we tarry together in the same place. We shall thus understand that we have lost too much of their time while they were alive. But will you tolerate men who are most careless of their friends, and then mourn them most abjectly, and do not love anyone unless they have lost him? The reason why they lament too unrestrainedly at such times is that they are afraid, lest men doubt whether they really have loved. All too late, they seek for proofs of their emotions. If we have other friends, we surely deserve ill at their hands and think ill of them if they are of so little account that they fail to console us for the loss of one. If, on the other hand, we have no other friends, we have injured ourselves more than fortune has injured us, since fortune has robbed us of one friend but we have robbed ourselves of every friend whom we have failed to make. Again, he who has been unable to love more than one has had none too much love even for that one. If a man who has lost his one and only tunic through robbery chooses to bewail his plight rather than look about him for some way to escape the cold, or for something with which to cover his shoulders, would you not think him an utter fool? You have buried one whom you loved. Look about for someone to love. It is better to replace your friend than to weep for him. What I am about to add is, I know, a very hackneyed remark, but I shall not omit it simply because it is a common phrase. A man ends his grief by the mere passing of time, even if he has not ended it of his own accord. But the most shameful cure for sorrow in the case of a sensible man, is to grow weary of sorrowing. I should prefer you to abandon grief rather than have grief abandon you. And you should stop grieving as soon as possible, 
since even if you wish to do so, it is impossible to keep it up for a long time. Our forefathers have enacted that, in the case of women, a year should be the limit for mourning. Not that they needed to mourn for so long, but that they should mourn no longer. In the case of men, no rules are laid down, because to mourn at all is not regarded as honorable. For all that, what woman can you show me of all the pathetic females that could scarcely be dragged away from the funeral pile or torn from the corpse, whose tears have lasted a whole month? Nothing becomes offensive so quickly as grief. When fresh, it finds someone to console it and attracts one or another to itself. But after becoming chronic, it is ridiculed, and rightly, for it is either assumed or foolish. He who writes these words to you is no other than I, who wept so excessively for my dear friend Aeneas Serenus, that in spite of my wishes I must be included among the examples of men who have yet been overcome by grief. Today, however, I condemn this act of mine, and I understand that the reason why I lamented so greatly was chiefly that I had never imagined it possible for his death to precede mine. The only thought which occurred to my mind was that he was the younger, and much younger, too, as if the fates kept to the order of our ages. Therefore, let us continually think as much about our own mortality as about that of all those we love. In former days I ought to have said, My friend Serenus is younger than I, but what does that matter? He would naturally die after me, but he may precede me. It was just because I did not do this that I was unprepared when fortune dealt me the sudden blow. Now is the time for you to reflect, not only that all things are mortal, but also that their mortality is subject to no fixed law. Whatever can happen at any time can happen today. Let us therefore reflect, my beloved Lucilius, that we shall soon come to the goal which this friend, to our own sorrow, has reached. And perhaps, if only the tale told by wise men is true, and there is a born to welcome us, then he whom we think we have lost has only been sent on ahead. Farewell. End of letter 63. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Letter 64 of Moral Letters to Lucilius by Lucius Anias Seneca, translated by Richard M. Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Philosopher's Task Yesterday you were with us. You might complain if I said yesterday merely. This is why I have added with us. For, so far as I am concerned, you are always with me. Certain friends had happened in, on whose account a somewhat brighter fire was laid. Not the kind that generally bursts from the kitchen chimneys of the rich and scares the watch, but the moderate blaze which means that guests have come. Our talk ran on various themes, as is natural at a dinner. It pursued no chain of thought to the end, but jumped from one topic to another. We then had read to us a book by Quintus Sextius the Elder. He is a great man, if you have any confidence in my opinion, and a real stoic, though he himself denies it. Ye gods, what strength and spirit one finds in him! This is not the case with all philosophers. There are some men of illustrious name whose writings are sapless. They lay down rules, they argue, and they quibble. They do not infuse spirit simply because they have no spirit. But when you come to read Sextius, you will say, He is alive, he is strong, he is free, he is more than a man. He fills me with a mighty confidence before I close his book. I shall acknowledge to you the state of mind I am in when I read its works. I want to challenge every hazard. I want to cry, Why keep me waiting, fortune? Enter the lists. Behold, I am ready for you. I assume the spirit of a man who seeks where he may make trial of himself, where he may show his worth. 
and fretting mid the unwarlike flocks he prays some foam-flecked boar may cross his path or else a tawny lion stalking down the hills i want something to overcome something on which i may test my endurance for this is another remarkable quality that sextius possesses he will show you the grandeur of the happy life and yet will not make you despair of attaining it you will understand that it is on high but that it is accessible to him who has the will to seek it and virtue herself will have the same effect upon you of making you admire her and yet hope to attain her in my own case at any rate the very contemplation of wisdom takes much of my time i gaze upon her with bewilderment just as i sometimes gaze upon the firmament itself which i often behold as if i saw it for the first time hence i worship the discoveries of wisdom and their discoverers to enter as it were into the inheritance of many predecessors is a delight it was for me that they laid up this treasure it was for me that they toiled but we should play the part of a careful householder we should increase what we have inherited this inheritance shall pass from me to my descendants larger than before much still remains to do and much will always remain and he who shall be born a thousand ages hence will not be barred from his opportunity of adding something further but even if the old masters have discovered everything one thing will always be new the application and the scientific study and classification of the discoveries made by others assume that prescriptions have been handed down to us for the healing of the eyes there is no need of my searching for others in addition but for all that these prescriptions must be adapted to the particular disease and to the particular stage of the disease use this prescription to relieve granulation of the eyelids that to reduce the swelling of the lids this to prevent sudden pain or a rush of tears that to sharpen the vision then compound these several prescriptions watch for the right time of their application and apply the proper treatment in each case the cures for the spirit also have been discovered by the ancients but it is our task to learn the method and the time of treatment our predecessors have worked much improvement but have not worked out the problem they deserve respect however and should be worshipped with a divine ritual why should i not keep statues of great men to kindle my enthusiasm and celebrate their birthdays why should i not continually greet them with respect and honor the reverence which i owe to my own teachers i owe in like measure to those teachers of the human race the source from which the beginnings of such great blessings have flowed if i meet a consul or a praetor i shall pay him all the honor which his post of honor is wont to receive i shall dismount uncover and yield the road what then shall i admit into my soul with less than the highest marks of respect marcus cato the elder and the younger laelius the wise socrates and plato zeno and cleanthes i worship them in very truth and always rise to do honor to such noble names farewell end of letter sixty four recording by john van stan savannah georgia letter sixty five of moral letters to lucilius by lucius annaeus seneca translated by richard m gummier this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the First Cause I shared my time yesterday with ill health. It claimed for itself all the period before noon. In the afternoon, however, it yielded to me. And so I first tested my spirit by reading. Then, when reading was found to be possible, I dared to make more demands upon the spirit. Or perhaps I should say to make more concessions to it. I wrote a little, and indeed with more concentration than usual, for I am struggling with a difficult subject, and do not wish to be downed. In the midst of this some friends visited me, with the purpose of employing force and of restraining me, as if I were a sick man indulging in some excess. So, 
conversation was substituted for writing, and from this conversation I shall communicate to you the topic which is still the subject of debate. For we have appointed you referee. You have more of a task on your hands than you suppose, for the argument is threefold. Our Stoic philosophers, as you know, declare that there are two things in the universe which are the source of everything, namely, cause and matter. Matter lies sluggish, a substance ready for any use, but sure to remain unemployed if no one sets it in motion. Cause, however, by which we mean reason, molds matter and turns it in whatever direction it will, producing thereby various concrete results. Accordingly, there must be in the case of each thing that from which it is made, and next an agent by which it is made. The former is its material, the latter its cause. All art is but imitation of nature. Therefore, let me apply these statements of general principles to the things which have to be made by man. A statue, for example, has afforded matter which was to undergo treatment at the hands of the artist, and has had an artist who was to give form to the matter. Hence, in the case of the statue, the material was bronze, the cause was the workman, and so it goes with all things. They consist of that which is made and of the maker. These Stoics believe in one cause only, the maker, but Aristotle thinks that the word cause can be used in three ways. The first cause, he says, is the actual matter, without which nothing can be created. The second is the workman. The third is the form which is impressed upon every work, a statue, for example. This last is what Aristotle calls the Eidos. There is, too, says he, a fourth, the purpose of the work as a whole. Now I shall show you what this last means. Bronze is the first cause of the statue, for it could never have been made unless there had been something from which it could be cast and molded. The second cause is the artist, for without the skilled hands of a workman that bronze could not have been shaped to the outlines of the statue. The third cause is the form, inasmuch as our statue could never be called the lance-bearer, or, or the boy binding his hair, had not this special shape been stamped upon it. The fourth cause is the purpose of the work, for if this purpose had not existed, the statue would not have been made. Now, what is this purpose? It is that which attracted the artist, which he followed when he made the statue. It may have been money, if he has made it for sale, or renown, if he has worked for reputation, or religion, if he has wrought it as a gift for a temple. Therefore, this also is a cause contributing toward the making of the statue. Or do you think that we should avoid including among the causes of a thing which has been made that element without which the thing in question would not have been made? To these four Plato adds a fifth cause, the pattern which he himself calls the idea, for it is this that the artist gazed upon when he created the work which he had decided to carry out. Now, it makes no difference whether he has his pattern outside himself, that he may direct his glance to it, or within himself, conceived in place there by himself. God has within himself these patterns of all things, and his mind comprehends the harmonies and the measures of the whole totality of things which are to be carried out. He is filled with these shapes which Plato calls the ideas, imperishable, unchangeable, not subject to decay. And therefore, though men die, humanity itself, or the idea of man, according to which man is molded, lasts on, and though men toil and perish, it suffers no change. Accordingly, there are five causes, as Plato says, the material, the agent, the makeup, the model, and the end in view. Last comes the result of all these, just as in the case of the statue. 
to go back to the figure with which we began the material is the bronze the agent is the artist the makeup is the form which is adapted to the material the model is the pattern imitated by the agent the end in view is the purpose in the maker's mind and finally the result of all these is the statue itself the universe also in plato's opinion possesses all these elements the agent is god the source matter the form the shape and the arrangement of the visible world the pattern is doubtless the model according to which god has made this great and most beautiful creation the purpose is his object in doing so do you ask what god's purpose is it is goodness plato at any rate says what was god's reason for creating the world god is good and no good person is grudging of anything that is good therefore god made it the best world possible hand down your opinion then o judge state who seems to you to say what is truest and not who says what is absolutely true for to do that is as far beyond our ken as truth itself this throng of causes defined by aristotle and by plato embraces either too much or too little for if they regard as causes of an object that is to be made everything without which the object cannot be made they have named too few time must be included among the causes for nothing can be made without time they must also include place for if there be no place where a thing can be made it will not be made and motion too nothing is either made or destroyed without motion there is no art without motion no change of any kind now however i am searching for the first the general cause this must be simple inasmuch as matter too is simple do we ask what cause is it is surely creative reason in other words god for those elements to which you referred are not a great series of independent causes they all hinge on one alone and that will be the creative cause do you maintain that form is a cause this is only what the artist stamps upon his work it is part of a cause but not the cause neither is the pattern a cause but an indispensable tool of the cause his pattern is as indispensable to the artist as the chisel or the file without these art can make no progress but for all that these things are neither parts of the art nor causes of it then perhaps you will say the purpose of the artist that which leads him to undertake to create something is the cause it may be a cause it is not however the efficient cause but only an accessory cause but there are countless accessory causes what we are discussing is the general cause now the statement of plato and aristotle is not in accord with their usual penetration when they maintain that the whole universe the perfectly wrought work is a cause for there is a great difference between a work and the cause of a work either give your opinion or as is easier in cases of this kind declare that the matter is not clear and call for another hearing but you will reply what pleasure do you get from wasting your time on these problems which relieve you of none of your emotions rout none of your desires so far as i am concerned i treat and discuss them as matters which contribute greatly toward calming the spirit and i search myself first and then the world about me and not even now am i as you think wasting my time for all these questions provided that they be not chopped up and torn apart into such unprofitable refinements elevate and lighten the soul which is weighted down by a heavy burden and desires to be freed and to return to the elements of which it was once a part for this body of ours is a weight upon the soul and its penance as the load presses down the soul is crushed and is in bondage unless philosophy has come to its assistance 
and has bid it take fresh courage by contemplating the universe, and has turned it from things earthly to things divine. There it has its liberty, there it can roam abroad. Meantime, it escapes the custody in which it is bound, and renews its life in heaven. Just as skilled workmen, who have been engaged upon some delicate piece of work which wearies their eyes with straining, if the light in which they have is niggardly or uncertain, go forth into the open air and in some park devoted to the people's recreation, delight their eyes in the generous light of day. So the soul, imprisoned as it has been in this gloomy and darkened house, seeks the open sky whenever it can, and in the contemplation of the universe finds rest. The wise man, the seeker after wisdom, is bound closely indeed to his body, but he is an absentee so far as his better self is concerned, and he concentrates his thoughts upon lofty things. Bound, so to speak, to his oath of allegiance, he regards the period of life as his term of service. He is so trained that he neither loves nor hates life. He endures a mortal lot, although he knows that an ampler lot is in store for him. Do you forbid me to contemplate the universe? Do you compel me to withdraw from the whole and restrict me to a part? May I not ask what are the beginnings of all things? Who molded the universe? Who took the confused and conglomerate mass of sluggish matter and separated it into its parts? May I not inquire who is the master builder of this universe? How the mighty bulk was brought under the control of law and order? Who gathered together the scattered atoms? Who separated the disordered elements and assigned an outward form to elements that lay in one vast shapelessness? Or whence came all the expanse of light? And whether it is fire or something even brighter than fire? Am I not to ask these questions? Must I be ignorant of the heights whence I have descended? Whether I am to see this world but once, or to be born many times? What is my destination afterwards? What abode awaits my soul on its release from the laws of slavery among men? Do you forbid me to have a share in heaven? In other words, do you bid me live with my head bowed down? No. I am above such an existence. I was born to a greater destiny than to be a mere chattel of my body, and I regard this body as nothing but a chain which manacles my freedom. Therefore, I offer it as a sort of buffer to fortune, and shall allow no wound to penetrate through to my soul. For my body is the only part of me which can suffer injury. In this dwelling, which is exposed to peril, my soul lives free. Never shall this flesh drive me to feel fear, or to assume any pretense that it is unworthy of a good man. Never shall I lie in order to honor this petty body. When it seems proper, I shall sever my connection with it, and at present, while we are bound together, our alliance shall nevertheless not be one of equality. The soul shall bring all quarrels before its own tribunal. To despise our bodies is sure freedom. To return to our subject, this freedom will be greatly helped by the contemplation of which we were just speaking. All things are made up of matter and of God. God controls matter, which encompasses him and follows him as its guide and leader, and that which creates, in other words, God is more powerful and precious than matter, which is acted upon by God. God's place in the universe corresponds to the soul's relation to man. World matter corresponds to our mortal body. Therefore, let the lower serve the higher. Let us be brave in the face of hazards. Let us not fear wrongs, or wounds, or bonds, or poverty. And what is death? It is either the end or a process of change. I have no fear of ceasing to exist. It is the same as not having begun. Nor do I shrink from changing into another state, because I shall, under no conditions, be as cramped as I am now. 
farewell. End of letter 65. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.